Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Leader of the Government, Senator Hill. Uh, Madam President, I seek leave to move a motion on terrorist attacks against the United States of America. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Madam President, I move that the Senate, one, expresses its horror at the terrorist attacks which have claimed so many lives in the United States of America, two, conveys to the Government and people of the United States of America the deepest sympathy and sense of shared loss felt by the Government and people of Australia, three, extends condolences to the families and other loved ones of those Australians killed or missing as a result of the attacks, four, declares that such attacks represent an assault not only on the people and the values of the United States of America, but on free societies everywhere. Five, praises the courageous efforts of those engaged in the dangerous rescue operations underway. Six, believes that the terrorist actions in New York City and Washington DC constitute an attack upon the United States of America within the meanings of Articles 4 and 5 of the ANZUS Treaty. Seven, fully endorses the commitment of the Australian government to support within Australia's capabilities, United States-led action against those responsible for, such, for these tragic attacks, and eight encourages all Australians in the wake of these appalling events to display those very qualities of tolerance and inclusion which the terrorists themselves have assaulted with such awful consequences. Madam President, as this Senate meets to debate this motion, on the other side of the world, in the middle of the night, a small army of courageous rescuers many of them volunteers, continue their efforts to find life within the ruins of what once were the Twin Towers of the World Trade Centre. Almost a week has passed since we watched with horror as the unprovoked and cowardly attacks in Washington, New York and Pennsylvania unfolded. It is still impossible to comprehend the depths of evil and cruelty which could have motivated such a senseless and vicious attack. We are still unsure of the extent of the human tragedy caused by these barbaric, atta barbaric attacks. Around 5,000 lives seem senselessly wasted. Thousands of families, both in the United States and around the world, left to grieve their loved ones and to try and make sense, some sense of why this has happened to them. As a parent who knows what it's like to have children living or working overseas for extended periods of time, I deeply sympathise with those Australian families who have had their worst fears confirmed. I also fear for those families who wait in hope to hear news of their loved ones still missing in the wake of these attacks. It's important for these families to know that they are not alone in their time of grief. The Australian people share their anger, their outrage and their sorrow with them. We continue to hope against hope that some good news will emerge. That sympathy is also extended to the family of New South Wales woman Amanda Rigg, who was killed in another senseless act of terrorism in Istanbul last week. The attacks in the United States might stand out in their enormity, but the death of this young woman again underlines the growing threat that terrorism poses around the globe if we allow it to go unchecked. At this time of global uncertainty, it's also vitally important for the people of, United, of the United States to know that our nation stands with them in condemning those responsible for these attacks. The Prime Minister has already conveyed to President Bush Australia's very deep sense of condolence, our empathy and our compassion for the American people. He has assured him of Australia's resolute solidarity with the American people. We will stand by them, we will help them and we will support actions they take properly to respond. Today's motion gives the Senate the opportunity to endorse and reinforce that message. I also take the opportunity in a formal sense, Madam President, to inform the Senate that the Prime Minister has announced 
that the government has decided, in consultation with the United States, that Articles 4 and 5 of the ANZUS Treaty applies to the terrorist attacks on the United States. This action has been taken to underline the gravity of the situation and to demonstrate our steadfast commitment to work with the United States in combating and defeating international terrorism. Let us make no mistake, this was not just an attack on the United States, but also a direct attack on the institutions of freedom, democracy and the rule of law that we in Australia and which so many people around the world hold dear. If we truly value our, our own freedom, we must be ready to defend the freedom of others from the barbaric acts of terrorism we have witnessed in the United States. Those responsible must be found and punished. The democratic world must no longer be held hostage to such horrendous behaviour. We must also redouble our efforts to address injustice, intolerance and poverty wherever it occurs. But also we must not lash out blindly in anger. This message is as relevant domestically as it is internationally. Attacks on individuals or groups on the basis of their ethnic background or religious or cultural beliefs simply undermines the values we seek to uphold. To simply lash out vengefully is compatible, incompatible with the values of a peace-loving democratic nation. Madam President, out of the sorrow and the suffering of the past week has also come inspirational stories of great personal sacrifice and strength. I have already made mention of the firefighters, paramedics and other volunteers risking their lives at both disaster sites, many of whom lost close colleagues who had been performing similarly heroic deeds when the Twin Towers collapsed. The sense of unity of purpose that has swept across the United States has revealed the true strength and grit of that nation's people. That this sense of unity has been shared by all freedom-loving people in the democratic world gives me great confidence that as a united force we can stare down the threats of those who would have, have us cower in the face of terrorism. If I could close with the words of the famous, famous American aviationist Amelia Earhart, courage is the price that life exacts for granting peace. And I commend the motion to the Senate. Senator Faulkner. Um, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, the opposition uh, supports the resolution as moved by the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Madam President, a new chapter is being written in American history, one of tragedy and terror, but also of strength and courage few could match. The terrorists may have set out to destroy America's confidence and faith in itself, but instead they have revealed the best in Americans what makes the United States of America such a great and resilient nation. We saw it in the selflessness of the rescuers, those firemen and police who charged up the stairs of burning buildings and were never seen again. We saw it in the courage of those who helped others to safety and the courage of those still waiting to hear the fate of their friends and family members. And we saw it in the courage of the people on the aircraft who sacrificed themselves in order to stop a greater tragedy. We will never forget the horror of this attack. However many times we bring it to mind, I don't think we'll ever get used to it. We will never forget our feelings when we first saw those extraordinary pictures of the attack and tried for the first time to make sense of it. Wherever we were, I think we all knew that things were changing forever, although we didn't know quite how or why. Today we think of the American victims, thousands of them, and their families. And we also think of the 70 or more Australians missing, many believed dead in this terrible tragedy. We know that in the coming days and weeks, difficult national decisions will have to be made as we show our support for the United States and those in the world community who are united in their fight against terrorism. 
But we must show our support for the United States in this fight because the fight against international terrorism is our fight. That's not only because of those Australians missing, believed killed, but also because of our belief in freedom, a belief that we hold in common with the United States. It was a shocking thing to think of the vulnerability of the Australians accompanying the Prime Minister in Washington at the time of the attack, so very close to the White House, which we now believe only escaped harm through the self-sacrifice of the passengers on the flight that went into the ground near Pittsburgh. Nevertheless, we are glad that the Prime Minister was there in the United States and was able to go to the Congress and our, add our support in person at a time when it must have meant a lot to our allies to have him there. His presence there certainly brought the events closer, as did the knowledge that so many Australians have been lost and our hearts go out to their families as they await news. Madam President, the scale of this unspeakable act of terrorism is so great we sometimes lose sight of the loss of up to 70 Australians. America is not a foreign country to our people. So many of us travel there and work there. This makes us feel even more that it was an attack on all of us. The Australian Labor Party is missing one of its most loyal and active members in Andrew Knox, who worked on one of the top floors in one of the destroyed towers and is still missing. It's with great sadness that uh, I express our condolences to his family, friends and political colleagues as they wait news of Andrew. Andrew Knox was a member of the South Australian branch of the Labor Party and a member of our campaign team in Macon at the last election, the area in which he grew up and loved. Andrew's family has been contacted by many of those he assisted as an employee of the Australian Workers' Union, and his efforts for them will also be remembered. Our deepest condolences go to Tom and Marion, Andrew's parents, and Stuart, his brother. Confirmed dead in the tragedy are Qantas baggage handler Alberto Dominguez, 66, and retired Red Cross worker Yvonne Kennedy, 62, both from Sydney. There are at least another 69 missing, including 23-year-old Chris Porter, 23, from Brisbane. We can only guess what they went through in their last hours. Our thoughts and prayers are with their families. Let us not forget either the many other nations that are mourning lost sons and daughters today. The size of the calamity is truly international. Among the missing are 100 Britons, several hundred Germans, at least 50 Bangladeshis, 70 Italians, many Pakistanis and Malaysians. It seems that nearly 40 nations have lost citizens in this shocking attack. Madam President, we've heard that there have been some who have blamed all Muslims for this tra tragedy. And I think we need to take a leaf out of Mayor Giuliani's book here. Even after all that was suffered in his city, he has never stopped talking about the need for unity, and he stressed that all New Yorkers are appalled, Muslims, Jews, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists and others. He's called on his fellow New Yorkers not to let the terrorists win by losing their humanity at this time. If a man who's had to deal with the full horror of this in his own city can keep his community together, surely we can keep our community together. We especially call on those in influential media positions to exercise responsibility. Those of us in public office must use our influence to maintain our unity as a nation. I would like to quote what British Prime Minister Tony Blair said in his speech on this very issue. We do not yet know the exact origin of this evil, but if, as appears likely, it is so-called Islamic fundamentalists, we know they do not speak or act for the vast majority of decent law-abiding Muslims throughout the world. 
I say to our Arab and Muslim friends, neither you nor Islam is responsible for this. On the contrary, we know you share our shock at this terrorism, and we ask you as friends to make common cause with us in defending this barbarism that is totally foreign to the true spirit and teachings of Islam. Madam President, we have all been impressed by the United States government's rational, deliberative and calibrated approach and response to this tragedy. America's quiet, unyielding anger is not doubted and it is shared by its friends. Lincoln said we should have faith that right will make might. By ensuring rightness of action, the US will be able to draw on the might of many countries. When it takes action abroad, the US government and its allies must decide how to crack down on the groups plotting this carnage, but in such a way as to try and avoid any more martyrs, anything that would feed the revolutionaries' cause. The great challenge before the US government is to show its people that it means to stop this sort of terrorism, but not at the expense of taking away people's basic freedoms, freedoms on which the United States of America was founded. This sort of behaviour is not new. People have sacrificed themselves and others to draw attention to their cause in every generation and in many countries. The difference now is technology, the sheer scale of the terror that they wreak. Difficult though it is to believe, the scale of this atrocity could have been and could one day be even greater. It could have been nuclear or chemical or biological weapons. The challenge is to stop the terrorists with every means at our disposal, but it must be done in such a way as to avoid feeding the, uh, the terrorist cause that creates new martyrs. It takes common sense and coolness, and the United States of America has shown that in recent days. We must heed the call for help from our ally. Madam President, we in Australia remember in our darkest hour in World War II when, uh, when our wartime Prime Minister, John Curtin, called on the Americans for help, and they did not let us down. The Battle of the Coral Sea and the Battle of Midway, they were there for us and fought valiantly, with many lives lost, to halt the progress of the enemy. We will be with them again, as we have been in every major conflict over the last 100 years. We must do our utmost to assist in fighting this most difficult enemy, one that lives in the shadows without a face. We do have to beat it because it has struck right at the heart of what we believe in, at our freedom and at our safety. The attacks on New York City and Washington DC have fundamentally changed the modern threat of terrorism. Mass terrorism is now a reality. Governments worldwide must respond to this new reality. National leaders must demonstrate that they are prepared to deal with a fundamentally new level of threat to ensure that people can go about their lives in peace and security. Australia will need to commit itself to an international intelligence police and military effort against those who planned the atrocities in New York and Washington and those who supported and harboured the perpetrators. Labor will support this in a bipartisan fashion and will see this effort through should we win office later this year. Australia will need to join the strong international coalition to fight terrorism wherever it threatens democratic and peaceful nations, as suggested by Secretary Colin Powell. 
This will mean integrating more closely our intelligence and police agencies with their international counterparts. It will also mean providing appropriate military and police support to international counter-terrorist operations, a long-term counter-terrorist strategy and resource commitment is now required. The role of the SAS and Commonwealth law enforcement and intelligence agencies will be critical, and they must have the tools to do their job in the modern terrorist environment. We in the Labor Party have already put forward some ideas to combat terrorism here in Australia. This is a time for bipartisanship, for working together, and we look forward to joining the government to talk further on this. Madam President, we've seen uh, an extraordinary uh, outpouring of emotion in Australia over this tragedy. Uh, we've seen flowers placed outside the consulates and the people flocking to places of worship yesterday to add their uh, prayers and thoughts to those of Americans for all those killed and, of course, those who've lost their friends and family. It is at times like this that you come back to what is truly important in all our lives—family, friends, community, security. That is what has been attacked. That is what we must defend. Senator Stott Despoja. Thank you, Madam President. The tragic terrorist attacks in America affect Australians and Australia. First and foremost, of course, those who have lost loved ones. Madam President, there are 69 Australians still unaccounted for and three confirmed dead among the 5,000 estimated fatalities. It is a time of great sorrow. As Senator Faulkner mentioned, one of those Australians missing is Andrew Knox, who was working in the World Trade Centre on the 103rd floor. I apologise, Madam President, for being late to the chamber as I was speaking with uh, uh, Stuart, his, his brother. He's a, Andrew is a dear friend of mine, and uh, I join with Senator Faulkner in sending our best wishes uh, to his family at this time and our condolences. The pain being felt by Andrew's family and his friends, many of whom are in this building, as they wait for news is repeated hundred times across Australia today. This is actually one of the biggest single losses of Australians, Australian civilians in our history. The difference between civilians and service personnel is one that civilised nations hold dear, and it's one that we must maintain in the times ahead. Everyone, not just those with a personal connection to this tragedy, will remember where they were, when they heard, when they saw these events unfold. We need to acknowledge that the feelings of sorrow, fear and, in some cases, anger extends to many Australians. The immediacy of the images make it feel so close. Courage, compassion and respect for the rule of law must guide us. We cannot turn our backs and we cannot strike out blindly. International corporations and the role of the United Nations will be key. There is no quick salve and justice may be slow. The difficulties of bringing those responsible to justice is frustrating, but I believe the guilty will be punished and that justice will be done. It is important, Madam President, that grief does not ruin reason. There will be no appeasement, but the military response to this terrorist attack must be proportional. America and its allies have enormous firepower, but not an accurate target. Random attacks would be tantamount to terrorism itself. Leaders must keep cool heads and pain must be tempered by patience. There are both legal and moral issues of international violence. Foremost is the difference between innocence and guilt. Rash, random military retaliation would not only be morally wrong, it would be counterproductive. As the Canberra Times editorial said, Americans are justifiably angry, but their wrath must reflect the civilization under attack, not the barbarity which would bring it down. Our aim is to reduce risks rather than inflame tensions. The Democrats believe that the ultimate aim must be peace, not World War III. We need to respect the rule of law, and particularly the rules of war, that civilians are not legitimate targets of war and that the ultimate aim is peace. We must strengthen international ties, 
more than ever the world needs cooperation. A war against terrorism can only be fought through international cooperation, particularly through the United Nations. Australia feels the emotional and the political fallout, the other fallout as well, militarily, uh, economic, uh, of terrorism in, in America. There are strong and enduring factors that sustain the US-Australian relationship. Our two countries have similar cultural and ideological heritages, and there are strong technological and economic links. In fact, an attack of this kind only highlights how small the world has become. We're closer to other people on the other side of the world than ever before, and not just Americans, because our grief today is spread across the world. Madam President, the enemy in this instance can't be identified by a religion or a race, but by their actions. This is not about where people are from or what they wear or the god they worship. If we inflame racial and religious-based hatred and intolerance, then the terrorists will have struck another blow. Madam President, I commend the addition of point number eight to the motion. We should be clear that the United States has declared a war against terrorism, not a war against Muslims. The Democrats stand by our record on foreign affairs and defence policy, and specifically our stand on ANZUS and the proposed US national missile defence system. In the war against terrorism, the strategy of mutually assured destruction, weapons of deterrence and weapons of mass destruction are of little use. Certainly, certain death, uh, clearly certain death, is not a deterrent to this enemy. Australia must continue to support international multilateral frameworks and support treaties uh, such as the Anti-Landmines Ottawa Treaty, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and the Ballistic Missile Treaty. Australia must examine our readiness to face this kind of attack. And the focus of the Defence White Paper was traditional threats. The Democrats continued to believe in the importance of an Australian Defence Force with independent capability as well as, as well as well resourced reserve forces and, of course, emergency services. There have been calls to ratify the two outstanding United Nations conventions on terrorism. And, Madam President, Defence Minister Peter Reith's response yesterday on the Sunday program is that we do not need to sign onto these treaties because they are already covered under domestic laws. I would think that would indicate that we agree with the treaty's intent and we should sign and we should encourage other nations to do so. The best support Australia can give in the fight against terrorism is intelligence rather than just military. The response must be information-led. We need to know the enemy. The war on terrorism must entail further restrictions may entail further, further restrictions on privacy, but it must be balanced, of course, with the respect for freedom. If we create a police state, then terrorism has won. Terrorism is a threat that Australia has rarely been touched by to date. In light of recent events, the Australian Democrats would support more resources being allocated to Australia's defence services. Madam President, the motion before us today, by and large, is an expression of horror at the events that have taken place. It's also an expression of sympathy and condolences, not only to the people of the United States, but to those Australians affected. And I endorse Senator Faulkner's point that we must not lose sight of this fact. It is not entirely appropriate that the government has included at the end of this motion of condolence two points that are somewhat ambiguous. And I'll take the opportunity to clarify the Australian Democrats' position and our understanding of their intent and scope. Point six refers to the ANZUS Treaty. We should be clear about what Article 4, to which the government refers in the motion, says. It says in total, each party recognises that an armed attack in the Pacific area on any of the parties would be dangerous to its own peace and safety and declares that it would act to meet the common danger in accordance with its constitutional processes. Any such armed attack and, uh, and all measures taken as a result thereof shall be immediately reported to the Security Council of the United Nations. Such measures shall be terminated when the Security Council has taken the measures necessary to restore and maintain international peace and security. In other words, it has always been the intent of the ANZUS Treaty that the United Nations would have a central role. Madam President, the seventh point of this motion does not give Parliament approval to an open-ended commitment of Australian troops outside a United Nations mandated action, and we would certainly hope that is not the intent behind the point of that motion. This could not possibly be the intention of the motion. 
We are sure on a matter as serious as this that the government would act honourably and that the parliament would have the opportunity to examine any commitment of Australian troops. This is too serious a matter to be slipped onto the end of a condolence motion. In fact, it would be highly inappropriate. Of course, Australia should do everything possible to help find and take action against those responsible for these horrible attacks. And there are many ways that Australia could conceivably assist in terms of intelligence, uh, medical, logistic support, ships and uh, possible special forces troops. But this parliament, Madam President, should not, and it cannot, and I hope it would not, make an open-ended uh, commitment of Australian troops under United States command at this time. So on this point seven, uh, at this stage, uh, uh, we give the government the benefit of the doubt, although I think it would be more appropriate that that section of the motion should be removed from a condolence motion before us. Madam President. Order. Senator Stocks, Boyer has the call. Madam President, the majority and the spirit of this entire motion is respected by the Australian Democrats and the condolences are felt wholeheartedly. Senator Boswell. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, on behalf of the National Party, I fully support the resolution that was moved by the uh, Leader of the Government. Madam President, less than two years ago we celebrated the birth of a new millennium. Only a year ago we were cheering at the Olympics. And just a couple of weeks ago, well, we had the Goodwill Games. And now, only a few days ago, America was attacked. We left behind a century bitten by bloody conflict and massive loss of life by man's own hand. We welcomed a new hope and a new beginning. Our champions ran faster and swam faster than ever before. We basked in sporting glory and a hundred years of democratic nationhood. Now we know we left nothing behind. After all, human barbarism followed us into this new millennium. It stalked our celebrations. It shattered our ceremonies until it caught up with us on September the 11th when it targeted our freedom. Just eight days before, our symbol of freedom the Australian flag was 100 years old. Then we knew who we were and where we were going. Today, we do not know where that flag will take us tomorrow. In this year of our centenary of Federation, I have often spoken about the need to cherish and value our democracy and political institutions. I have met the overly cynical attacks on politicians with disquiet. In uncertain times, we must be united in our beliefs of what is important. We must be united to be strong. When American sovereignty is attacked, Australian sovereignty is attacked also. When Americans die, Australians die. The victim of the attacks in New York, Washington and Pennsylvania are universal martyrs of democracy, of a way of life that cherishes freedom, democracy and equality. That is the thing about democracy. You don't need to be a soldier to be a hero. Your freedom defines you, not your uniform. It is the only the older generations of Australia who have known this kind of terror. It has not been visited upon our younger generations until now. How innocent their days have been, how light their worries, how bright their hopes, until September the 11th. Sullied and unacknowledged innocence. Young children have been exposed to trauma that not even their parents have witnessed. We meet here today to express our deep condolences to the victims and to consider what responsibilities we must take to overcome such monstrous, cowardly and savage brutality. As lawmakers and leaders, we must deliberate wisely and act with measured courage. Our country has risen to the occasion many times in the past, and it will do so this time also. Our relationships with America changed last week because Australians were victims in the planes and the buildings. We are soldered in the same grief. 
Because our Prime Minister was in Washington, the Australian people are indelibly written into the events that unfolded. We were with them at this terrible hour. We were on hand to offer our support. When the Speaker of the United States Congress acknowledged our Prime Minister and the grief-stricken Congress rose as one in a standing ovation, we were there. The American people will rally in their grief and in their anguish. They will draw deeply from their reservoir of faith and confidence in what they believe. They will be formidable in their defence of freedom. They are fortunate to have such a rich history of outstanding leaders over the centuries to guide them. There was Gettysburg in 1863 where 51,000 Americans were slain or wounded. Almost without exception, the fallen were soldiers. Today, almost without exception, they are civilians. Abraham Lincoln fi finished his famous Gettysburg de uh, dedication with words that ring more loudly now than for many years. We here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a, f a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people and for the people shall not perish from this earth. In 1917, President Woodrow Wilson stated that the world must be made safe for democracy. Democracy is again unsafe today. These attacks on it are not made by declarations of war by foreign governments. They are not made by anyone who has been freely and democratically elected to do so. They are not voted on or supported by large communities of people. They are made by autocratic, self-styled leaders of shadowy groups who so, so debase the value of life and liberty that they send their deluded, indoctrinated, fanatical followers to violent deaths alongside their innocent civilian victims. It is an evil mind that can do this, which violates the fundamental tenets of the three great religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. In 1963, when President Kennedy made his famous speech about the Berlin Wall, he said that freedom is indivisible and when one man is enslaved, all are not free. Today we face a new wall, the yellow wall of terrorism. In his inaugural address, President Kennedy issued a call to the nations of the world that echoes powerfully today. He said, my fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Ask us here the same high standards of strength and sacrifice which we ask of you. On September the 11th, America paid a terrible sacrifice. All democracies must now ask the question for a new century. What can we do together for the freedom of man? Indeed, what is there that together we can do? Today, our sovereignty is breached and violated. Who would have thought when we were in Melbourne in June, recalling the legacy of leaders who served us so bravely in the, in the past threats to our sovereignty, who would have thought then that our role would change so swiftly from celebration to confrontation with wars and famous cousin terrorism? God grant us the ability to emulate the legacy of earlier generations of Australians, their courage, their wisdom, their strength, and unity. Senator Cook. Uh, thank you, um, Madam President. I support the motion. On July the 4th, 1776, the then 13 United States of America declared their independence with these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Madam President, these words still remain today as the finest expression of human aspiration ever given official form. They form an ideal for all of us as individuals. 
They, they form an ideal that society at large strives for, and they form an ideal which we in this parliament, as representatives of the Australian people, in our wisdom struggle to encode into wise laws. That they are not Australian words or come from another era does not matter. They do have an international resonance. For the thousands who died last week in New York, Washington and Pennsylvania, they now cease to have a meaning. Their lives are gone, their liberty abruptly curtailed, and the happiness in their lives brutally extinguished for all time. The 21st century has dawned ignominiously. Whatever innocence there was left over from the last 100 years has now vanished. The new reality is that hatred and its offspring, terrorism, now threaten all of us, wherever we are, no matter how innocent we are. Our era, our era sadly, has dawned with a new high-tech terrorism. Those who work in buildings of iconic architecture, in offices of government administration, or in the airline systems of the world, and almost anywhere where there are any other nationally important activities are the front line. Fear of flying for those among us reluctant to board an aircraft has given way to a wider fear for those about who might be flying with us. What is their purpose and what hidden dangers are there in the cargo bay? No greater symbol of this new and dangerous era was the photograph that last week appeared on the front page of the Herald Sun. It was of a, it was of a Boeing 747 in the shadows of the World Trade Center moments before impact. This fearful image had the simple and accurate headline, Pure Evil. Our thoughts today are with those who have died, with their families and with their loved ones. Our thoughts are with the myriad of rescue workers who even now are toiling to free up the site, to recover the bodies, to provide a decent and respectful funeral and to repair the damage. Some of the most poignant images of this disaster are the images of heroism of these workers, are images too of people who on the hijacked planes rang home or those in the buildings facing death transmitting their last expressions of love before vanishing forever. For Australia, there is the particular grief of still 69 missing Australians and their families and friends. The resolution means that the Senate gives its condolences to all of those who are suffering, all of those who have been hurt and all of those who have died. Like all expressions of grief, it always seems insufficient in the circumstances. Our expressions of grief, though, are nationally symbolic and are heartfelt and are extended not just to the Americans and the Australians involved, but to the citizens of the other estimated 38 countries who have lost their own fellow country per persons. Today, Ambassador J. Thomas Schieffer made an impressive and memorable speech to the memorial service in the Great Hall in the Parliament. He made in his remarks, I think, a vital point. I wish to quote it. He said, it is important for all of us to remember that just as Hitler was no Christian, those who committed these acts were not men and women of faith. No Christian, no Jew, no Muslim could have done such a thing. The common thread that runs through these great faiths is that loved, love must conquer hate, good must defeat evil. They are sentiments too, I'm sure, that all of us in the chamber join with. The justice that now must be delivered to the perpetrators is a justice that Australia must play its part in delivering. We are committed to this end. The Australian Labor Party has set out a list of national and international actions that can be taken. As has been said, we stand ready to join a bipartisan approach to ensure the most comprehensive and unifying national action. It is important that the right people are dealt with. This is a sentiment given ample voice in the chamber today. 
It reminds me of what Tom Friedman said in the New York Times last Friday, and I quote him. Because these presumed Muslim terrorists did not just want to kill Americans, that is not the totality of their mission. These people think strategically. They also want to trigger the sort of massive US retaliation that makes no distinction between them and other Muslims. That would be their ultimate victory, because they do see the world as a clash of civilizations, and they want every Muslim to see it that way as well and to join in their jihad. That is the development that must be resisted. That is why we must deal with the perpetrators, because any other course will play into their hands and ignite a possible conflagration that will end the lives of many other innocent people. Our strength is that we stand for the innocent and we stand for civilization and we stand against terrorism. But there is time to do the right thing. Today we should show our resolve. Today we should express our sympathy to the victims and, at, and the horror at the acts of terrorism that have, that have occurred. Today is an occasion to praise the, the rescue workers, to back the ANZUS Declaration and to support the United States. And at the end of the day, it does come down to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, to, to deliver these basic aspirations to all people. It is as human as that, and that is our task. Senator Brown. Thank you, Madam President. On behalf of the Greens, I join all senators and my fellow 19 million Australians in extending the deepest sympathy and a strong comforting arm to everybody affected by the appalling carnage in America. The terror of last Tuesday turned four civilian aircraft loaded with passengers into firebombs, which have left thousands dead or maimed in Lower Manhattan in Washington and in that field in Pennsylvania. I grieve for the tens of thousands who have lost loved ones, family members, friends and colleagues and my heart aches for the more than 70 fellow Australians and for the many other citizens around the world who died in these cowardly attacks. This criminal tragedy has made the world reflect upon the hazards, as well as the promise, of globalisation, indeed, on the future of all, all uh, human community on the earth. If the exquisite once only experience on earth of human life is not to come to nothing, we at the dawn of this century must find a way to a more enduring peace and security. Even after the wars of the 20th century, Tuesday's unintelligent, unloving, spiteful sabotage of our innocent fellow human beings' lives the lives of thousands of warm-hearted people shows that we have achieved neither enduring peace nor security in the world community. The path to achieving those ideals is away from that of grinding poverty being permitted side by side with prodigious wealth. Security cannot coexist with the global arms trade. Peace will not be found beneath a trillion dollar shield or above missile silos. True happiness cannot come without true security and peace being shared and available to everyone. As a Green, Madam President, I accept that the reality of our existence will always depend upon policing against evil that the price of peace is indeed eternal vigilance. But we must work for a world in which that vigilance is against true evil, not against the hungry seeking food, the powerless seeking power, or the despised seeking acceptance. The true goal of globalisation must be, in terms of power, one person, one vote, one value. In terms of possession, it must be assured food, assured shelter, assured education, assured opportunity 
for every citizen on the globe. In terms of purpose, it must be access to love, to community, to creativity, to having a, a personal part in the building of the future for everyone. These things do not now exist for millions of people around the world, but we must work to ensure that they do. We cannot survive with the power of modern technology unless together, as one world, we ensure that power is used in the service of all and is itself made subservient to a safer world in the interests of all life on this earth into the future. The way ahead is via global welfare and democracy. We will not survive a world of inequality, for inequality breeds enmity and enmity breeds hate. Like all the world at this moment, I don't know who decreed Tuesday's terrorism. Whoever planned it and for whatever reason, it is utterly unforgivable. If it does involve the Osman bin Laden, all the more so, for his wealth, his wealth speaks for itself. His use of the power flowing from that wealth is unforgivably and utterly corrupt. His invocation of God or Allah is the sign not of madness, but of an arrogant and misplaced effort to blame the mystical for his own egoistic disdain for the innocents his targeting has killed. The deities have no place in politics. In politics, we are utterly responsible for our actions, period. The villains must be found and brought to justice, but the suffering of more innocent people must not be entertained in the course of that goal, not least the suffering of the already downtrodden, humiliated and mistreated powerless masses of Afghanistan and its neighbours. There is a great duty of care on President Bush and his administration to ensure that only the guilty are punished. For otherwise, the injustice of Tuesday will be extended. I applaud America's place in the progress of human history. But like those of every other supreme power before it, America's decision makers are human and are fallible. Our Prime Minister Howard is right to express solidarity with the people of this friendly nation in their hour of anguish. But he get, must give no blank script to any other politician of any other nation for Australian policies or actions in the future, particularly unspecified policies and actions which come out of this sorry affair. It is the responsibility of our government to be prudent as well as strong in the months, weeks and years ahead. The world's most powerful nation is talking of war. Its president is talking of war. This is a time for allies to extend not only a helping hand but also a word of timely and appropriate restraint. Madam President, this is a time, as Kofi Annan put it on day one last Tuesday, for cool heads. Otherwise, history will judge more than the terrorists harshly. Last week's diabolical episode shows that power and justice are not the same thing, that power without justice brings misery. It will be a measure of the maturity of the world that the response demanded by Tuesday's inexcusable destruction of innocence does not involve more of the same. The world grieves for the thousands who have died. We must work to ensure that that grief is assuaged by justice according to our own principles rather than compounded by a vengeance emulating that of the perpetrators. Madam President, this, is, this uh, motion involves a deep condolence to those who have suffered from last Tuesday, and I totally endorse it. However, section six and seven of the motion 
also involve Australia uh, giving uh, backing to the use of force in unspecified ways by the President of the United States. Let us remember that the President has been given that right to judge who is guilty and then to act against them uh, by the almost unanimous one dissenter dissenting Congress in the United States. I believe that it would be judicious for this nation to take part as warranted according to our own judgment and not to be in the business of transferring that judgment to Washington. I therefore move that six, section 6 and 7 of this motion be replaced by the words, 6, urges world leaders to respond to calls for revenge with calm and reason, recognises that unmitigated military retaliation in response to this mass murder may accelerate the cycle of fear, anger and violence, and 7, supports the rule of international law the perpetrators of these crimes should be brought to justice through the appropriate enforcement of that international law. And eight, calls on member states of the United Nations, which have shown swift solidarity of commitment to bringing the terrorists to justice, to immediately instigate action through the United States, including military action as necessary to achieve that aim. In support of that amendment, Madam President, I would draw honourable senators' attention to the United Nations Charter itself, which effectively means that an attack on any other nation must come through the United Nations itself. We are in a fast-moving world of inevitable globalisation. We are charged to find an inter a rule of international law. We must not find ourselves infringing that law which is already in place. We must build upon it, not infringe upon it. The United Nations, Madam President, is the agency which so should coordinate what appears to be the unanimous response of the community of nations in tracking down and bringing to justice those responsible for the terrorism of last Tuesday, involving, as may be necessary, swift uh, military action to that end. But we on this world will be a safer place if we act as a community of nations through the already written international law, rather than taking unilateral, bilateral or other action outside the formulations which we have agreed to in the United Nations. I therefore commend these amendments to the Senate, and with those amendments we will be supporting the, the uh, motion. Senator Ferris. Thank you, Madam President. As the chair of the US-Australia Parliamentary Friendship Group, I support the condolence motion before the Senate. There are 65 parliamentary friendship groups in the Australian Parliament of which the USA-Australia group is the largest, with 123 members and senators. Our group is proudly bipartisan, and over the years we have developed a very close working relationship and indeed friendship with each of the American ambassadors, members of the staff at the United States Embassy and the many congressmen and women and senators who have visited this country since our friendship group was first formed back in 1988. Parliamentary friendship groups play a very important role in maintaining and strengthening our relationship with nations from around the world. During my term as chair of the friendship group, I have been privileged to enjoy close friendships with three ambassadors, Her Excellency Jenda Hawkins Holmes, more recently His Excellency Skip Ghanaim, now serving the United States in Jordan, and of course our recently appointed ambassador, Mr Thomas Schiffer. In November 1999, I was a member of a parliamentary delegation from, of members of this chamber who visited New York and Washington. 
As well as visiting the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, we held a working lunch with senior officers of JP Morgan at the Trade Centre. And can I particularly express my sympathy towards JP Morgan, who had 3,500 workers in the World Trade Centre, of whom several hundred are still missing. On behalf of the Friendship Group, our sympathies also go to the new ambassador to Australia, and I commend him for the moving speech he made at this morning's memorial service. Like everybody else here, last Tuesday night, when wakened by a call from a friend to immediately put on the television, I thought about the safety of many of our young Australians who are living and working in New York and around the Trade Centre. In fact, Sally Rumble, a talented young graphic designer from Canberra and the daughter of a close family friend of mine, was working not very far from the Trade Centre when this terrorist attack took place. She and her colleagues saw this terrible tragedy unfold from the roof of the building in which they worked in Manhattan. And as all the phone lines collapsed in the area for several hours, there was a painful wait for her parents, Max and Inga, who are in the gallery, before it could be confirmed that she was indeed safe. But there are still more than 70 Australians missing, and many of them will be our youngest and most talented people who now are working around the world in the developing industries. And our thoughts are with their families and their friends, and some of them have already been mentioned in this chamber today. On behalf of all members of the Australia-USA Friendship Group, can I as chair extend my sympathies to all the victims of this terrible tragedy and, of course, the family and friends in the United States and around the world who are affected by this despicable attack. And like everybody else in this chamber and in this country, I look forward to seeing the perpetrators of these vicious crimes being hunted down and brought to justice. Senator Sherry. There are a few events in our lives that are so dramatic, so dramatic that in some cases, and in some cases so horrific, that we remember them till the day we die. We remember those images, what we were doing, and where we were at that point in time. In my memories, the walk by Neil Armstrong on the moon, the invasion of East Timor and its subsequent freedom, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Sydney Olympics, and last week the terrorist attack on New York and Washington will all be carried in my memory till the day I die. To view the extraordinary live TV coverage after Late Line last week, watching planes in, in suicide bomb attacks, my thoughts firstly went to the hundreds of passengers and crew who were in those planes. As the skyscrapers collapsed like a pack of cards, my thoughts went to the thousands, the thousands of individual human beings who were being crushed alive and to the hundreds of emergency service personnel who died under that falling rubble. 5,000 human lives gone, and amongst them 69 missing Australians. My extreme sadness, my heart goes to the thousands who lost their lives, to their families, to their friends and to their colleagues. The United States is entitled to seek justice, and such justice must be proportionate based on the evidence that's available. If, as appears likely, the perpetrators are motivated by Islamic fund fundamentalism, they are a tiny minority of that religion. History is filled with examples of terror carried out by a few in the name of their religion. To give but a few examples, the Crusaders, when capturing Jerusalem in 1099, slaughtered every Muslim in the city and burnt the Jews alive in the synagogue. Saladin, when he recaptured the city 100 years later in the name of Islam, 
did not kill one human being. The Inquisition. More recently, the Hindu extremists blowing up mosques in India and the Catholic and Protestant civil war in Northern Ireland. History is filled with extremism carried out in, a, in the name of a person's religion. The President of the United States, George Bush, has been considered in his response, and two themes in particular are important. He has clearly announced the determination of the United States to seek direct justice by military means. And going further, he has sought the international cooperation of well over 100 countries around the world and indicated the United States more actively participating in the various forums of the United Nations. In seeking to win a war on terrorism, we must ensure that it, that it is the guilty that are punished and that our goal is a long-term and just peace. Again, history is filled with examples of the winning of a war by military means but leading to a peace that has in turn led to further conflict and repression. The so-called peace of World War I led directly to the rise of Nazi Germany and World War II. The peace of World War II led to the consolidation of the Stalinist regime in the former Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain of a totalitarian repression falling across Eastern Europe for almost half a century. An effective end to terrorism must include dealing with many of its causes. The poverty, the malnourishment, the repression and the rights of ethnic and religious minorities. These are fundamental to tackling the root causes of the terrorist problem. In my opening remarks, I mentioned a number of events that are stamped indelibly in my memory. They are, they are events that highlight both good and evil of humankind. I have no doubt that there is good in all humankind and that good will triumph over evil. Senator Harradine. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, this time last week, I asked uh, my staff uh, for the time difference between New York and Australia. Um, I was uh, in communication uh, with uh, people there uh, preparatory to my going to New York. I should have been in New York today. This fact uh, has uh, been an added poignancy uh, to uh, the de distress and mental anguish uh, that I, along with so many others, felt uh, after uh, hearing of and viewing the effects of the diabolical terrorist acts perpetrated uh, against uh, uh, persons of 40 nations in uh, New York, uh, Washington and Pennsylvania. In particular, I feel for our American brothers and sisters we need at this time especially to show solidarity with them in this dark hour. Today we as a national parliament have the opportunity to publicly express our sympathy to all of those who have been affected to those within Australia who still have loved ones unaccounted for, uh, to those of the other nations which were mentioned by the, uh, the government and the leader of the opposition, and particularly for those uh, in America itself. Our heart goes out to them and on behalf of myself, my family, my constituents, I offer them my sympathy. The whole of Australia 
is grieving with you. Each one of us know where we were when we first heard of the developing tragedy. We heard as accounts came in of the disastrous consequences of these diabolical acts of terrorism. We were horrified by them. We had a surge of revulsion. And so often people publicly express prayer to the compassionate God to assist those who had lost loved ones and for the loved ones themselves. Isn't it a reflection on our capacity of free will? How the Creator must think, must place great importance on the dignity of each individual human being. That that individual human being can reject that and still have free will. It's a great mystery to me and of course it's one which is at the heart of human life. The response that came from the community in the United States and here was a, an immediate response. Their response involved a wonderful sacrifices. The goodness came out of people. Their self-sacrificing service to others. So many people responded to the call for public prayer for the victims, for the loved ones, for the emergency crews, for, any, for anyone who was affected by the tragedy, and for the leaders of the free world. Madam President, as has been said before in this, uh, in this discussion, we are facing, or we have faced and we are still facing, some of the darkest days in our total history. But in facing those darkest hours, we do need to have hope. And particularly we must pray for a resolution of this problem and for guidance for the US president particularly. There will be attempt, uh, an attempt to use huge firepower on the day of the tragedy, or it was in fact the next day, um, it was the same day here in Australia, but uh, I was asked about it and I said this after having expressed uh, profound sympathy to the United States of America and its people. I said that all the people that I've seen and met this morning have said that their thoughts and prayers are with the victims of this diabolical act of terrorism. We need a new commitment, a renewed commitment to stamp out terrorism which threatens civilization and free societies everywhere. But we cannot allow these evil acts to plunge the world into a climate of war 
This would play into the hands of the perpetrators of the diabolical acts of ter terrorism. Yes, Madam President, there will be those temptations. There will be temptations to e exercise um, powers which will restrict the freedom of our societies. But we do need, in this tragic hour, to reflect how effectively our free societies contribute to genuine human flourishing. That's what we should be on about, genuine flu uh, uh, human flourishing, and I'm sure all, all colleagues around this chamber. That is our objective objective to enhance this human flourishing. But um, uh, George Weigel, whom I've been reading recently, said that uh, JP2 was of the view, and I agree with it, that um, free societies will only contribute to genuine human flourishing, where democracy and the market are disciplined by a vigorous and vibrant public moral culture founded upon a shared public conviction of what is moral truth, so that you can discern good from evil, right from wrong, justice from injustice, etc. We do need to uphold this in any response uh, that uh, will arise pursuant to the need to stamp out terrorism of this nature. We do need, as has been said around this chamber, to put more resources into tackling the underlying causes of conflicts in those areas of the world in which these are most evident. And I refer, for one, to the Middle East situation, or situations. These are hotbeds of recruitment for the fanatical proponents of terrorism. The last thing that we want, and I'm sure the last thing the Americans want, is a response to these barbaric acts with the type of barbarism of our own. We must, we must uphold the rule of law. We must not do anything that would damage our human flourishing, our free society. It's easy for us to say that here, so many thousands of uh, kilometres from uh, America, which has borne the brunt of this terrorism. But I'm sure, with guidance, the leaders of our free societies will respond in an appropriate uh, way, bearing those matters in mind. In Australia, we cannot allow, we, we cannot allow this uh, bigotry uh, to flourish. Pointing the finger of Arabs or persons of Islamic uh, faith. Indeed, President Bush himself said that this was an act <coughs> of people that did not respect human life. 
President Bush said that. And the fact of the matter is that respect for human life is fundamental to all of those religions who believe in one God. Christian religion, the Islamic religion, Ju uh, uh, Judaic re <coughs> uh, the, the uh, Juda Judaic religion. And in all of this, we need to ensure that we do have that respect for life. It is good to see that America has not responded to this in a way that they could have. In other words, isolationism. The Americans have got the power. They've got, they could stand and say, well, we'll turn inwardly. We'll make sure our borders are secure and nothing like this would happen and the rest of the world can paddle its own canoe. No, it hasn't taken that view and uh, it should be respected and supported. I'm pleased to stand here <coughs> and support this uh, resolution. Um, it is a very, very vital resolution and I do hope that our actions and those of the free world will be seen by generations to come as, have, as having stood up for life. Senator Sandy MacDonald. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President. I want to join other centres expressing our condolences uh, by this resolution to the United States Government and to the United States people uh, by this Senate. And I want to express my heartfelt sympathy to those who lost family and friends on Tuesday of last week. Like everybody else, I was instantly paralysed by the horror of the events in New York, Washington and Pennsylvania. And like many senators, I have been to the top of the World Trade Centre and the magnitude of the bricks and mortar damage alone puts this brutal act in perspective. For no reason and without warning, thousands of innocent people have had their lives changed for forever and needlessly. Children have lost parents, parents have lost children. No country, Australia included, has escaped this horror. And I want to take uh, particular note of the missing Australians, about 70, and I pay particular note and extend my strongest feelings of sympathy and empathy to the three Australian families who, as reported in the media, as having lost their lives, and they include the families of Mrs Kennedy, Mr Deminx and Chris Porter from Brisbane. To them, Godspeed and God bless. I hope that their loved ones did not suffer the horror of their, uh, their, their untimely deaths slowly or in agony. And to those other Australian families waiting for news, I hope it is good when it comes. Madam President, Australians stand by the American pe people in this time of crisis. The United States of America is a great provider of good and balance in the world. They are the remaining superpower. They always do what they think is best. Sometimes they may make mistakes, but the world and Australia would miss them if they weren't there pursuing what they see as fair and decent. America has an unparalleled record of extending its hand to people and countries that need assistance. I was only reminded on the weekend by my mother when she said that she and probably millions of other people in Europe would have starved during World War II if it hadn't been for the US food parcels that crossed the Atlantic to war-torn Europe. And that has been applied in so many ways across the whole gambit of American humanitarian and military aid over the last 100 years. They are a fantastic nation, having thrown the welcoming shadow of the Statue of Liberty over millions of displaced people who came to the New World 
to build the most powerful nation on earth. I want to make uh, two final points. Firstly, the, the hate that must be burnt into the souls of those who harboured and carried out these acts, acts is impossible for us to understand, impossible for us to comprehend. But comprehend it we must, otherwise we will become its continuing victim too. And secondly, the military response must be certain, it must be sustained and it must be determined to root out the perpetrators of this terrorism. These people must be punished. The world must be protected against them. America has the resources to do this. Australia will support them, both morally and to the military level that we can. Madam President, I say God bless America. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I rise uh, today uh, not only on behalf of uh, myself and the Labor senators here today, but also Senator Gibbs, Senator Vic Lucas and Senator Hogg uh, from Queensland. I rise today, as I've said, to express my support for this motion and to say to the people of the United States of America, particularly those that have lost friends, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers and children and, of course, work colleagues, that the thoughts and prayers of my fellow Queenslanders are with them all during these most difficult times. Madam Chair, like the most Australians, I woke up on the morning of the 12th of September, a date I'm sure will always remain black and infamous in our collective memories. To witness on television the utterly despicable acts of terrorism taking place in New York and Washington. No words can express the horror I felt as I witnessed the destruction of the World Trade Centre and the attack on the Pentagon. No words can express the sorrow I felt as I witnessed the terrible suffering and loss of human life caused by these cowardly acts. And no words can express my anger and revulsion towards those who organised and committed these cowardly attacks. Madam Chair, as the tragic results of these attacks have become more clear during this week, I can assure that the people of the United States of America that the feelings of horror revulsion and anger felt by my fellow Queenslanders as witnessed on the television images this tragic, of, of this tragic event have not diminished. Indeed, if anything, these feelings have become stronger and more focused. We must all realise that these attacks were not just against the World Trade Center, the Pentagon or indeed against the United States of America. These were deliberate attacks against very powerful symbols of democracy in a country that is itself a powerful symbol of democracy. These attacks were designed to strike at the heart of all Western democracies that respect freedom and are governed by the rule of law. Let me say that if these attacks were an attempt to damage or somehow change our view towards freedom and democracy, then these attacks will have failed. Will the world change as a result of these cowardly attacks? Yes, in my view it sadly will. The way we go about our travel will change. The way we go about securing our nation will change. But will our respect for democracy or love of freedom change? I can say on my behalf, no, it won't. If anything, the events of the past week have shown us that, as stated by the Premier of Queensland, the Hon. Peter Beattie, democracy is like a fragile flower. It has to be protected. These events have clearly demonstrated that there is no place for terrorism in this world. Far too many innocent people who did nothing more than go to work have lost their lives in New York and Washington because someone somewhere wanted to make a political statement. I think it is important for us to make it clear to the world that acts of terrorism are not political statements but acts of murder against the innocent. The people who perpetrated these attacks must be brought to justice. No stone should be left unturned in determining who is responsible for these crimes, not just for those who committed the individual acts of terrorism, but for those who have harboured, sponsored or protected them. Then, once found, these people must be brought to justice. It must be demonstrated that there is no place in our world 
for those who commit mindless acts of terrorism. The people and the government of the United States of America are to be commended for the way in which they banded together during this crisis. The images conveyed to us of the thousands of volunteers struggling in the shattered remains of the World Trade Center to recover survivors show the determination and compassion of the American people. The courage of the police and fire and rescue crews, many of whom were tragically killed in the line of duty, should be an inspiration to us all. I'm sure that the thoughts and prayers of all Queenslanders are with them and their families. The people and government of the United States of America should also be commended for their patience and restraint. In those first terrific hours after the destruction of the World Trade Center, it would have been very easy indeed to have lashed out. Instead, the American government and people concentrated on rescue efforts and conducting a proper investigation into these attacks. I'm sure that these investigations will uncover information that will bring to light the perpetrators of these barbaric acts. Once this has been done, then those responsible can be brought to justice. Madam Chair, it is also important to remember that this is not just an American tragedy. The World Trade Center was a workplace to many people from many nations. As we meet here, we should acknowledge that there are a few countries that have not been touched by the pain of the loss from this attack. Indeed, there were many Australians who were present at the World Trade Centre at the time of this cowardly attack, and sadly, many are still miss are listed as missing. Again, the thoughts and prayers of my fellow Queenslanders are with them. And perhaps I can say on a private note that the tragedy has extended its reaches to all places. As you've heard a number of speakers mention Andrew Knox is missing. My sorrow go to his family, Tom and Marion, his parents and Stuart, his brother. I had the pleasure some years ago now to work with Andrew in the union movement in Queensland. He was one of the first ACTU recruiters attached to the Australian Workers' Union. He spent some time in Brisbane and then in Cairns working for the union movement and gain, gaining uh, many valuable skills and experience. Queensland could not retain him. I recall that his love was for South Australia and his family, and he returned there. Andrew Knox sadly was not alone. This is clearly an enormous tragedy for Australia as well. Words do not do justice to the scale of the events, and they cannot alone comfort those who have been touched by these events, nor do they fill the void left in our hearts by these events. In closing, I would once again like to express to the people of the United States of America the condolences of the people of Queensland. We all share the sorrow and anger of your losses. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. Senator Bourne. Madam President, under normal circumstances, and obviously these aren't, when we all heard about a, uh, a passenger flight crashing into the ground in Pennsylvania, 44 people dead, the immense bravery of those on board in uh, ensuring that no further lives were lost, we would have been shocked, we would have been horrified, we'd still be shocked and horrified, and we still see that as a very, very significant tragedy for the world. But of course then we add to that another passenger jet that crashed into the Pentagon and 190 people are now feared dead there. So we add them to the 44. And then on top of that, of course, there's the almost unbelievable and certainly overwhelming figure of 5,000 people at the World Trade Centres. And like other senators, uh, I was woken up very late that night and told to go and watch the television, and I did, and I couldn't believe it. It seemed like there was a very bad movie on, uh, and some very clever graphic designer had designed something that looked all too real, and unfortunately it, it was all too real. There was huge bravery um, shown, huge bravery, by those plane passengers, by fire crews, many of whom are now dead, by police, the same, and by the rescue workers who are still going. Uh, in New York, and probably they're saying now it will take about another two months 
just to clear that site um, and to make it safe <clears throat> before anything else can start. And what all those people had to have in common, and obviously did, uh, was that they all had cool heads and they were all very sensible in their reactions. And obviously those cool heads will be needed beyond those sites now. They'll be needed by all world leaders uh, who are going to decide what to do next. And I understand nothing has been decided yet and I think it's very, very sensible to wait uh, and to get as much evidence as humanly possible before anything is decided. What gets us all through these sorts of things, and we have to remember that Australia has lived through a lot of really quite significant and quite terrible disasters, quite terrible. Uh, things like the Port Arthur massacre and the Ash Wednesday bushfires, the Cyclone Tracy, Newcastle earthquake, Australia's involvements in war overseas and Threadbow disasters, they all stand out uh, as terrible tragedies that Australians have lived through. And our sense of community got, got us through those terrible tragedies uh, in the past. And when you look at this tragedy now, with the number of Australians likely to be gone in the World Trade Centre, this tragedy rates as one of the largest Australian tragedies that we've ever had. And I think that a world sense of community will get us all through this, even though at the moment we all feel absolutely overwhelmed. Justice has to be done. Justice has to be seen to be done. But justice also has to be proportional, and it has to be seen to be proportional. How do we stop this happening? There's been a lot of commentary about that lately, and I think almost all of it has been very sensible and very reasonable commentary. The ones that I remember particularly uh, James Wolfenson this morning saying that what we have to go back and look at now with a new sense of urgency is poverty and desperation around the world, the disparity in the wealth around the world of the rich countries and of course America is seen as being the richest of them all and probably the World Trade Centre was seen as the symbol of that and the vast majority of the world who are living in desperation, who are poor and who feel that that doesn't need to be, and it doesn't need to be. So we do have to look at that. He's absolutely right in what he says there. I've also seen studies that show that tolerance and dissent are actually the avenues to growth and advancement of civilizations, and that societies that crush dissent breed fanatics, and ultimately they disintegrate. And that surely has to be a lesson for all of us. That has to be a lesson for all of us in this parliament, as well as everybody else around the world. These fanatics are bred by a lack of tolerance and the crushing of dissent. In looking through the motion that, um, when I was first shown the motion that, uh, that's been put up today by the government, I must say that I agree overwhelmingly with almost all of it. But I was a bit shocked to see number seven in there. I was a bit shocked to see something which can be construed to mean that we're giving an open-ended agreement to any commitment of troops by Australia or anything else by Australia. Um, I hope to goodness that it doesn't mean that uh, because I wouldn't and I know that there are substantial, very substantial uh, numbers of the Australian community who would not agree with that. Uh, but everybody, absolutely everybody in the Australian community would agree with parts one to six and with part eight. Oh, except of course Cinder Brown doesn't agree with part six but I think almost everybody would agree to it with parts one to five and part eight. Um, and I even agree with part six. I've read the ANZUS Treaty and I think that this, it's just a statement of fact and this does um, commit us to, uh, to carrying that out. Um, as a consequence of that, Madam President, can I ask that you consider um, Standing Order Number 84, Part 3, uh, when you put this motion today uh, and uh, that you consider removing parts six and seven. I think it would be a great pity, a huge pity, if the condolence and uh, sympathy and uh, the horror that is being expressed in parts one to five and also the tolerance and inclusion that's being in expressed in part eight. I know every member of the Senate will agree with all of those. I know it. And I know from listening to Senator Brown that he won't. Uh, and I uh, suspect to, um, from listening to others that uh, they don't agree with um, part seven either. And I must say, if it's construed to mean that uh, uh, that's an open-ended agreement by this Senate to any troop um, a commitment by Australia, I wouldn't agree with it either. So uh, 
can I ask that you please put those parts of the motion which I know will have absolutely overwhelming and wholehearted support uh, separately to those parts of the motion that don't. I think that would be far more appropriate. Can I end by saying that all those people who died, and heaven knows there were, there were thousands and thousands of them, all those people who died were going about their daily business. They were just people going to work, people going out to get breakfast, people who were travelling to other parts of the country. We were all absolutely and utterly horrified shocked, horrified and overwhelmed that people just going about their daily business could suddenly lose their lives this way. I know, I absolutely know that the response to this will not involve more of that, will not involve more of people just going about their daily business with no involvement in any terrorism or anything else suddenly dying. I know. I believe that that won't be the case uh, and I fervently hope that that belief will be carried out in the days to come. Senator Ellison. President, uh, in supporting this motion I take this opportunity to offer my condolences to the American people and particularly the American families who have suffered such terrible loss in recent attacks in the United States of America. These murderous acts of terrorism were perpetrated without explanation and were unaccompanied by manifesto. They were acts designed solely to achieve the greatest damage and loss of human life possible, but had no specific result in mind other than mass murder which they perpetrated. There is no justification for these actions which are inexplicable and there can be, no, there can be never any sympathy for the individuals behind these acts of indiscriminate terror. Our solidarity with the United States in its opposition to terrorism and to its commitment to eradicating these indiscriminate acts of ruthless terror is solidarity with all those who desire the continuation of civilised life. It is also, Madam President, with great sadness that we acknowledge the loss of Australians in this tragedy and, of course, we offer our condolences to the loved ones and families of those who have been lost and, in particular, our concern and sympathy goes to those families and loved ones who are waiting on news of those Australians who remain missing. They are all in our thoughts and prayers. The terrible loss of Australian life reminds us that this was an attack not just on the American city of New York and, and the Pentagon, but on the entire civilised world. This uh, week's age uh, listed the international roll call of nations who have lost uh, the lives of their citizens as some 28 nations, and I believe this is climbing. In Australia, immediate measures had to be taken in relation to uh, the security of various people and interests in this country. And I want to th take this opportunity to thank the men and women of the various law enforcement agencies in my portfolio of Justice and Customs, in particular the Australian Federal Police, the Australian Protective Services and the Protective Security Coordination Centre all worked quickly and professionally to put the necessary security measures in place. The PSCC brought together all Commonwealth agencies concerned and maintained an Australia-wide response by coordinating the National Anti-Terrorist Plan response. National crisis management arrangements in regard to Australia's counter-terrorist measures were also put in place immediately. At very short notice following the incident in New York, the Australian Federal Police and the Australian Protective Service provided additional protection to Australians, uh, United States, United Kingdom and Israeli interests around Australia. On being notified of the terrorist attack on the World Trade Centre in New York, the Australian Federal Police also immediately implemented an emergency response in accordance with its responsibilities to ensure the safety of Australian citizens and diplomatic premises. This is one part of the AFP's ongoing role in national security planning and in the evaluation of risks to Australia. Immediate liaison and, ass and assistance commenced with Australia's intelligence community and the AFP continues to provide intelligence and information. The Australian Federal Police has a protocol with the FBI and is coordinating, coordinating the large number of inquiries with state and Commonwealth partners. As the Prime Minister has stated, the terrorist attacks in, in the United States constitute an attack upon not only that country but also Australia within the terms of the meaning 
or terms of Articles 4 and 5 of the ANZUS Treaty. Just as Australia has declared its commitment to a military response, so too has Australian federal law enforcement committed itself to the search of, for those responsible. The Australian Federal Police particularly is working closely with the FBI and will offer every assistance to the FBI in the search for those responsible for these terrible acts. Madam President, the rule of law is absolute and Australia will play its part in seeing that those who perpetrated these acts are brought to justice. The fight against international terrorism requires international cooperation between legitimate law enforcement agencies. Australian law enforcement remains totally committed to this cause, and we will do all that is proper to see that justice is brought to bear on those people who committed these atrocious acts. Madam, President, Madam, Acting De Madam Deputy President, can I say that there is an old saying that bad things happen when good men and women stand by and do nothing. In this case, action is required, and that action, that action will be carried out in an appropriate manner by Australian law enforcement. Senator Lundy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on behalf of Territorians, including uh, in my own electorate here in the ACT and those in the external territories. And I understand my colleague, Senator Crossan, will be speaking on behalf of Australians from the Northern Territory. The terrorist attack on America is a tragedy of almost incomprehensible consequences, and we are all struggling to put into words just how we feel and what this means to us as individuals, communities, nations and, indeed, humankind. The human tragedy, the loss of thousands of innocent lives, has shocked all of us to the core. The events of September 11 will change forever the way we perceive our world. I wish to extend my personal condolences to the families and friends of all of those killed in the tragedy. I especially want to extend my deepest sympathy to the families and friends of the many Australians whose lives have been shattered by this attack. As we pause to remember and reflect on these events, it still doesn't seem real or possible. But the awful truth is that this act was real and it was planned and carried out in a manner that is truly despicable. It barely seems believable that human beings can rationally and meticulously set out to destroy so many innocent lives. Last Tuesday, we all experienced a shared grief and, sh and a shared sense of loss, and this collective spirit has now brought us together. Australia may be a long way from the US geographically, but emotionally, culturally and politically we are very close. And it is that special closeness that makes this most deplorable act an attack on our values, on Australian values, on our beliefs and on our society as well. The fact that there are still so many Australians lost and to be accounted for does make this specifically an attack on Australia. And we're not alone in this regard. People from some 40 nations around the world have, have suffered loss and are missing many more. And Australia, being a truly multicultural society, feels deeply for all of these nations and every person touched by this tragedy. Many of us, many Australians, uh, have chosen, um, to be their chosen America to be their home or have been posted there uh, for professional reasons, or indeed have family and friends around the New York and Washington areas. And uh, I know here in Parliament many of us have had the privilege of visiting the United States and cities such as New York and Washington DC, and I've been one who, for whom that privilege has been extended. One of the more emotional scenes last week was seeing colleagues and staff members awaiting emails confirming that their friends were okay and accounted for. I, would, I don't know if there's one person in Australia that has not been touched at least through one or two degrees by people directly experiencing this tragedy. 
The fact that few brave people were able to make contact through mobile phones from their hijacked planes played a vital role in preventing further tragedy, and it breaks everybody's heart as these stories continue to pour out. I understand that passengers alerted about the attacks in New York may have prevented the plane that crashed in Pennsylvania from hitting its intended target. Unfortunately, we'll never be able to reward these heroics personally. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade says two Australians who phoned their families from the World Trade Centre after, their after the first plane crash have not been heard of since. I cannot imagine how those families feel. And I cannot imagine the immense relief felt by those families and friends when they did receive that first phone call, only have it uh, to find out that their, their family was okay, but those also who received that phone call and then never hearing again. These family members and friends will relive that moment over and over for the rest of their lives, along with every word exchanged during that final phone conversation. For those Australians still unaccounted for, their families will keep, no doubt keep waiting for those phone calls. Following the horrific terrorist attacks, email and the internet became essential tools for helping friends and relatives from all over America and around the world make contact with loved ones. The World Wide Web has allowed stories to be shared, accounts to be given, so everybody can get a sense of just what has occurred. And I think through that proliferation of information that we've actually come closer. We're touched more closely, more personally, by the tragedy that has occurred. It's also a time now to reflect on the fire, police and ambulance officers who've lost their lives in this tragedy. These were people who devoted their working lives to servicing the community and those in need. They live, these people live modest lives and go to work every day with the knowledge that their lives are potentially in danger, something which bonds service personnel throughout the world. I would like to praise and honour the firefighters and police and of New York and the tri-state area whose efforts this week have been overwhelming, but also, and also in recognising them, the hundreds upon hundreds of volunteers, of people who've just come out to lend a hand in whatever way they possibly can. I know the memories of the officers and emergency service personnel who died last week will live on in the memories of their Australian comrades. And my heart goes out to all service personnel here and around the world and their families who kiss them goodbye every morning. I am reminded of their deep commitment to the safety of the community and it makes me realise how easy it is to take for granted those who make the, uh, the choice of a professional career in emergency services. Their lives are at risk. And how unfortunate is it that so many of them paid the ultimate price for that commendable choice in New York and Washington. I'd like to say, Madam Deputy President, that the increased security at Parliament House and official establishments around the world is most welcome, and I'd like to acknowledge the security staff here at Parliament House for their ongoing efforts and a job always well done. I know that many staff members have spoken to me about the need for increased security, particularly in the car parking areas that are not normally protected. And it's a sad day when our own safety and security is um, needed to be upgraded, as it has been for so many establishments around the world. But it also reminds me that it's not just about established institutions around the world, it's that innocent civilians were attacked, and so many of them lost their li lives without having any expectation of risk in going to their jobs on a day-by-day -day basis. I'd also like to acknowledge those young Australians embarking on a promising and bright career in the city that never sleeps, New York, who've had their lives tragically cut short. 
Whilst the world debates the merits of how to deal with terrorists, there's no doubt that we must act to prevent further threats, either here or abroad. And a positive outcome is not police states and infringements on privacy, but a preservation of our way of life and continuing value of our, and protection of our civic liberties. I cannot imagine the devastation caused by a similar incident in Australia. Our hearts go out to everyone affected by the tragic attacks in the United States, and I look forward to a day when all cultures can live in harmony and humanity finds a peaceful means to resolve its disputes. Senator Harris. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise this afternoon as we meet uh, in this place, aware of the events uh, in the United States of America that occurred on the 11th of September. There are many questions that will pass through our minds as we reflect on this horrific day. And I wish to add my personal condolences and those of the Queenslanders and Australians to the Australian families who lost their loved ones, to all Americans and all other countries who have lost their loved ones. And I would like to just quote from a piece of scripture from uh, John chapter 3, verse 16. And for God so loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. And we need also to reflect upon those service personnel, uh, those personnel who freely gave their lives to save others. And greater love hath no man or woman that lays down their life for a friend. Primarily, we must see all acts of evil in this world as firstly an act, act of evil against God and his moral laws, as contained in the Ten Commandments and in the law of love, that is, the gospel in Jesus Christ. Primarily, those involved in this act of evil will ultimately respond to God for their deeds. And in Psalm 37, verse 28, for the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. They will be protected forever, but the offspring of the wicked will be cut off. Secondly, God has established governments to be his administrators of justice and to pu punish evildoers. And in 1 Peter 2, verse 13, we read, Submit yourself to the Lord's sake, to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. However, these verses may not sufficiently on their own give an answer as to why this event happened in a world ruled by a loving and sovereign God. God's sovereignty and individual human responsibilities are two facts that we cannot deny. Every person involved in this event has or had a personal responsibility before God. Although these events were carried out under God's sovereign rule of his creation, God is not the author as the primary motive of these events. They were brought into play by the specific personal choice of those involved. It may help us at this point in time to compare this event with the most horrific event in human history, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. As awesome as these events are in the, in the USA, with the tragedy and suffering this has brought to many, the crucifixion of Christ is the tragic event of human history. 
For in this event we see much anguish of soul and suffering. He was unrecognisable and such fury and anger. He was bruised for our sins as never before, nor will ever be seen again in human history. Yet out of this greatest of human tragedy there comes hope for mankind and salvation. For should that all who will trust in God through Christ Jesus. And in Psalm 62, verse 1, we read, My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. What then do we say to if, of God's justice? Will this evil event go unnoticed or unpunished by God? Psalm 37 helps us to understand the wicked, their evil way, and eventually end before God. And in Psalm 37, verse 13, we read, Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been plagued. When I have tried to understand this, it was oppressed to me. Till I enter the sanctuary of God, then I will understand their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away in terror? Primarily, it is up to God alone to judge those involved in this horrific event and to deal with them as his will dictates. Yet this judgment may be enacted out through lawfully established governments that honour God and follow his laws of heaven. As Ariel Sharon said, this act of evil is against the laws of heaven and the gospel which we hold. And in concluding, Madam Deputy President, I believe as a Christian nation that our thoughts and prayers must also turn to forgiveness for those who have portrayed this diabolical act. Senator Watson. Deputy President, last Tuesday evening many people throughout the world watched their television screens in horror as a devastating, unbelievable scenario unfolded before their eyes. As one event followed another, the overwhelming extent of the terrorist attack left the world in shock, with people from over 40 nations, including 70 from Australia, perishing in New York, Washington and rural Pennsylvania. Many Australians have been deeply touched by this dramatic tragedy. Having visited the managing director, Robert Shepler, uh, and staff of Salomon, Smith and Barney Asset Management only three months ago in one of the Twin Towers in New York at the Trade Centre, these tragic events just have come so close to home. Fortunately, of all their staff, apart from four who were visiting some of the high, visiting higher up in the towers, all their other staff escaped. My sympathy goes to those who have been, lost their lives. There have indeed been many stories of hero, heroism and hope and scenes of despair. We've heard reports of a Catholic priest losing his life as he gave the last rites to a victim. Another man lost his life as he stayed with his com and comforted an injured colleague of two people who carried a disabled stranger down 68 flights of stairs to safety. With over 5,000 souls missing, so many lives have been affected either directly or indirectly. One British company is reported to have lost something in the vicinity of 100 of its workers at the World Trade Centre. How many years of experience and expertise that represents is indeed hard to imagine. What words are there to express the government's horror at these terrorist attacks? Our heartfelt sympathy goes out to those affected, both uh, far and near, and to all those rescue workers who have worked for hour upon hour in the hope of finding somebody else alive. I was particularly touched to see the construction workers in New York downing tools and going to the scene in order to offer their help. These men were not trained in rescue work, but they did have something to offer. It was their strength and willingness to help. This dreadful act reaches out further than those directly involved. It's an attack against the whole civilised world itself, including Australia. It's an attack against all we stand for, 
or we have worked for since the first settlers arrived here more than 200 years ago. The overwhelming feelings that have been felt in these last few days, including the leaders of this government, has resulted in the ANZUS Treaty being invoked, and this has put us in readiness to assist the United States government, whatever we can do. However, we Australians, along with the rest of the world, do need to move carefully in order to provide the international appropriate and measured response to this situation. The United States is indeed up against the shadow. Its claimed evidence points to bin Laden, but he has denied responsibility. Where do we look now? This is a modern form of guerrilla warfare, which could strike anywhere in the world. We need to keep vigilant to our own security and to avoid actions that could es escalate the problem. We need to remember the words of the Right Reverend Jack Knapp from the service today in the Great Hall. That is, the perpetrators of this dreadful attack are neither Christian, Jew or Muslim. They are people of no faith in a God. How can they, when they have taken so little account of innocent lives? We must care, take care to ensure that we are not found wanting ourselves in this way. Today in the Great Hall of Parliament House, almost 3,000 people participated in an international service of commemoration and thanksgiving, honouring the lives of victims of terrorism attacks in the United States. It was indeed a moving ceremony with barely a dry eye in the packed hall. His Excellency the Honourable J. Thomas Snithler Ambassador to the United States, in a very personal tribute, acknowledge the closeness of our two nations at this time of national disaster. Churches have opened their doors so that people can respond in a spiritual way, praying for justice, peace, for speedy recovery for the injured, and seeking comfort and strength for surviving family and friends. I was privileged to attend one such service uh, in Launceston, uh, led by the Reverend Richard Temby. This was not in a cathedral or a place of mass mourning, but in a simple suburban church where dozens of people offered their prayers. At times of great grief, the nations turned to the great architect of the universe, their God and their saviour. Our government has taken, I believe, the right step in committing to United States led action for an appropriate and measured response, which will seek out the perpetrators and punish them, as the world must not must be held hostage to these sorts of acts of terrorism. In, in conclusion, I wish to convey to the American people through the Senate a deep sense of condolence and support on behalf of my Tasmanian constituents. I thank the Senator. Senator Schott. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Rise to support the resolution. Last Tuesday evening, uh, Australian time, uh, I was, uh, had a very joyous occasion to attend, uh, as President of the Volleyball Federation, a victory uh, dinner for a magnificent young women's Australian team who had just qualified for the first time in 20 years to go to next year's World Championship, held here in a restaurant in Canberra. And as I was driving home, with the radio on, I wondered why CNN voices were coming over the ABC radio. And then I realised that something extraordinary had been happening. I pulled in here to Parliament House and discovered the security staff at the Senate entrance were watching the monitor, showing the burning towers. Went to my room, turned on the television, and stayed, like most Australians, transfixed by the horror for the next three or four hours. To say that uh, this is a time and a moment that one will never forget is an understatement. We always remember, those, old, those of us old enough, where we were when we heard that President Kennedy had been assassinated, or where we were when we'd heard that the Whitlam government had been sacked. But none of these things compare with the sheer horror of watching live on television a hunt two towers 110, metres tall, 110 storeys tall collapsing to the ground live on television. Uh, as though you were watching a Steven Spielberg disaster movie, except that you knew there were thousands of people at stake uh, and had lost their lives uh, at that moment. This is not just an American tragedy, this is a world tragedy. As others have said here today, something like uh, nearly, I think, 30 to 40 countries have had citizens lost in the disaster, in this terrorist act, this terrorist disaster in America. And so far, it looks like well over 70 Australians have lost their lives. In Australian terms, this is the biggest civilian disaster of loss of life where someone has murdered people in our history. 
where there have been other bigger disasters of accidents, coal mining disasters, uh, Cyclone Tracy, uh, uh, etc. None have matched the loss of life. No, there's been no other incident that's matched the loss of life. I suppose the Port Arthur massacre in 1996, when 35 were killed, uh, comes, is the only one that comes close. So this is an Australian disaster, uh, an Australian tragedy, uh, as much as it is, is an American tragedy that so many of our citizens have lost their lives. As a South Australian senator, it comes home to you within two days that this is a personal disaster when you find that one of the people who lost their lives is known to you personally. Others have mentioned Andrew Knox, a South Australian. I remember Andrew Knox putting his name forward to be the pre-selected candidate for the Labor Party for the coming federal election for the seat of Macon. He withdrew to take the opportunity to travel overseas and take the, the job that he had at the World Trade Centre. If he had stayed in South Australia, he may now well be aiming to be the next member for Macon uh, and being in this place, in this parliament, within two months, speaking on behalf of the people of the, area, of the Macon electorate where he grew up and has many friends. Instead, he is now, he, we are now uh, giving him his epitaph to his mother and father, Tom and Mary, and his brother, Stuart. Uh, all of us pass on our deepest sympathy and condolences in what must be a terrible, terrible moment for them to lose a son of such quality and calibre. We also uh, pay tribute, of course, to those who watched, uh, but also tribute to the uh, brave uh, firemen, firewomen, policemen, policewomen, and other security people who, first of all, risked their lives and then, in many cases, lost their lives in trying to save people uh, in the, uh, in the, twin, in the uh, World Trade Center. And we've all seen the photographs since of extraordinary scenes in New York and in Washington uh, of people remembering, uh, paying their uh, uh, condo condolences to these people. It shows that uh, in a civil society, the public service, the public sector, is something that we all need and should not be decried and belittled. These people don't get paid great sums of money. They spend their whole life in a dedicated service and at the best they'll get, we hope, is a reasonable pension after 30 or 40 years of service. But now we see hundreds of them have lost their lives in providing that service to the, to the, uh, to the American public. I also think we should acknowledge uh, from the evidence that's now appearing that ordinary Americans try to do heroic things to stop this incident occurring. The evidence emerging that Americans, pa uh, the passengers on the American, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, aircraft that crashed in Pennsylvania apparently decided when they knew they were probably going to die that they were going to try and take the plane back from the hijackers, unarmed, with no weapons, and uh, it's almost certain now they paid with their lives and those other passengers, but they probably saved several hundred other citizens elsewhere in Washington by the plane not hitting one of the targets. To, I think, most of us, it is still incomprehensible that ordinary people could suddenly and dramatically show such heroism under the, under the fact that they were about to die, that they would still try to save the plane and stop others being killed. Uh, it is unfortunate that possibly we may not be, ever be able to acknowledge specifically the names of those who, did, who tried to save that plane, uh, but we all know they, the, those passengers did save many others. The other thing that uh, the other aspect that I now wish to turn to is whatever the horror of this terrorist act is, the reason it resonates so terribly with us is that we've now seen on television and individually the impact on ordinary human beings, people like us. Watching around one o'clock on what was Wednesday morning in Australia, as people were having a choice, burn to death or jump to your death from the 80th or 90th floor of the World Trade Center. I have, when they showed the film of these people diving to their death, I, can't I could not imagine anything more worse. Uh, and also, 
trying to imagine the choice people were faced with in a matter of a few seconds. Uh, that in itself is more horror than most of us could ever uh, care to account for. I now turn, uh, Madam Deputy President, to the issue of why did this take place, which is beyond my comprehension. But one thing I am startled by and can't work out. The hijackers took these four planes with technology, the equivalent of what we call a Stanley knife in Australia. Americans called a uh, cardboard cutter. You can buy it for $2 at any hardware shop or newsagent in Australia. Despite all of us in the modern world having tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars of security equipment, of technology, a group of fanatics with a Stanley knife took hold of a plane and then killed over 5,000 people. The second thing that uh, comes to as it's now emerging, these weren't just a sudden rush of so-called blood, of fanatics going out to be a suicide bomber, occasionally like we've seen in the Middle East. And I just point out to the Senate, it just came on the news, that today in Kashmir, a suicide bomber killed nine uh, Indian policemen, uh, possibly with a connection to the same groups that may have been involved in the fanaticism that created this tragedy of last week. So every day now in the world, almost, fanatics are using, are going to the stage of killing themselves to kill others to make a political point. And no matter what the response of America is to uh, uh, use a military action, uh, force to punish those, it is clear that those who are willing to pay with their lives, sacrifice their lives, no matter how much you bomb them, it may not be the solution, as much as that might make, make, make us all feel good. I find it hard to believe that somebody has a religion, any religion, that means they could calmly and carefully over 18 months live in a society, prepare themselves to be trained to drive a plane into a building and calmly go out and do it as though this is just another fact of life. It is astonishing. Uh, it also means that uh, though we all claim God is on our side, Unfortunately, there are people in the world, whether they're Christians, Muslims, Hindus, or any other religion, from time to time claim God, their God, their view is the only view. We cannot, we cannot be uh, holier than thou, to use that phrase. We've had Christians killing each other in Northern Ireland for a very long time. We've had Sikhs killing uh, Hindus and Hindus killing Sikhs in India. We've had Israelis and Palestinians killing each other with, with, unfortunately, gay abandon in the Middle East. We've had the massacre of Rwanda, half a million, three quarters of a million people, not 5,000, three quarters of a million people massacred uh, for ethnic or religious reasons. We've had a million plus people killed in the Balkans in the last 10 years, again, partly because of the madness of religious identification, Catholics versus Orthodox, Orthodox versus uh, Orthodox versus Muslim. All we know is that individual, ordinary people have been massacred as a result. I think it does come to the, the bottom line that we have to start saying there is a very good reason to say that if you want democracy and decency in government, we must separate religion from the way we govern ourselves. I'd like to conclude, Madam Deputy President. I think on for an America, and this, this awful thing occurred in America, uh, some 140-odd uh, uh, years ago, America's greatest president, in my view, made the shortest great speech in the history of uh, the world to sum up democracy, Abraham Lincoln at the Gettysburg Address. That was a dedication to those who lost their lives at that, that terrible battle where um, thousands, tens of thousands were killed. But what he said there is still as relevant today as our commitment to democracy. And he said in 260 odd words the following, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. 
Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come here to dedicate a portion of that field as the final resting place for those who here gave their lives that this nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it cannot forget what they did here. It is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. It is, it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honoured dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave that last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Senator Lees. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The indescribable savagery that has claimed uh, so many lives in the United States has shaken the world. Indeed, uh, the world that we woke up to this morning is a very different one to the one that we woke to last Monday. I watched with my family as the horror unfolded on Tuesday night, the 11th of September, a date that will always be now engraved uh, in, our, in our memories and on the world calendar. And we watch with disbelief. We watch with shock and a sense of unreality that surely this was, was fiction. This could not uh, actually be happening. We waited some six hours for the phone call that was to come to tell us that one of our number was in fact safe, that uh, she indeed visited the Trade Centre a few days ago and had moved on. And our thoughts and prayers are now with all of those families uh, and the friends who aren't going to get that phone call. Uh, and our uh, prayers and our deepest sympathy must be with those whose lives have been forever changed uh, by this tragedy. We now must think of those who wait, who watch uh, and who hope that uh, at least uh, they will be able to um, say a final farewell to their friends and the members of their family as the aftermath is uh, removed and painstakingly um, sorted through. In the very short time that I have, I now want to move quickly uh, to part seven of this motion. As this reads, it is now unfortunately a blank cheque. It reads as unlimited support regardless of what the Americans decide to do and how they decide to do it, where they decide to act, regardless of any risks that more innocent people uh, may be killed. And I have to ask the government and the opposition why, in a condolence motion, why do we have potentially a commitment to war? And so a potential spiralling down into a cycle uh, of fear, of hatred, anger and violence. A commitment to effectively war led by the USA. Indeed, they have declared war on whom they are not sure. But as we read our papers this morning, we, we see very clearly their intent. We have no detail as to what will be involved for us. We're just supporting them all the way with the USA. Now, I want to make it very, very clear. We cannot ignore terror terrorism in any of its forms. But we must track down with care those responsible and have some patience. We must also not forget our core values. We must respect human rights and freedoms. We must uphold the sanctity of life and protect our democratic values. We are giving enormous power to one man, as indeed the American Parliament has before us, approving a motion giving President Bush full authority. And now we, apparently without question as to what particularly Part 7 means, we are lining up as well. Of course, we must track down the perpetrators and give America and other nations every support in doing that. But we must also look at reducing the root causes of terrorism poverty, alienation, oppression, corruption and the hopelessness that is felt by so many families when they cannot support, even with basic food, their own. If Afghanistan was bombed 
a humanitarian nightmare would follow. We know what life is there, uh, like there already. For most Afghan people, that country is always a place, is already a place without basic fundamental human rights, particularly for women. There is frequently a life of poverty, despair and famine, a life without hope. So I cannot condone, I cannot in any way support a motion that may in fact be uh, supporting further suffering. I support all other parts of this motion and particularly welcome the addition of part, no, uh, part 8. However, I ask that understanding order 84 that part 7 be put separately. Senator Mason. Madam Deputy President, in rising this afternoon to speak to this motion, I'm reminded of the words of President Lyndon Johnson, spoken almost 40 years ago, soon after another tragic event in the life of America tested that nation's resolve. He said, all that I have I would have gladly given not to be standing here today. And so it is again. Madam Deputy President, the horror and the tragedy, as well as the hope and the triumph of the human spirit, are often captured with more brilliance in the simple words of everyday people than, all, than in all the great rhetoric of leaders and of politicians. I have before me a letter from one New Yorker to an Australian friend, and it reads, It's now 10 p.m. and we've been going since 8 a.m. Where do I begin to tell you about this day? We got an early call from the Salvation Army to come in. They took us to what is called Ground Zero, just across the street from where the World Trade Centre stood. We stood side by side with America's finest. They came in from all over the country, police, firemen, search and rescue, construction workers. I walked amongst them as they came out of the rubble handing them cold water, food and giving, them, and giving them someone to talk with. Most of them have been here since Tuesday. Many of them have lost part of their team in there. So many of them were just needing someone to talk with and tell of what they'd seen and witnessed. All day these guys were saying thank you to me. I would put my arms around them and tell them how proud we were of all of them. A few would break down for only a moment. And I was so grateful I could be there for them at that time. I watched as they brought out the five firemen who were trapped in their truck since Tuesday. Thank God all were alive. I saw a policeman brought out who didn't make it. At day's end, we asked some officers if they could give us a ride back uptown. As we drove out, there were about six blocks of people standing on the side of the street with banners reading, Thank you, you are our heroes. They were clapping and cheering as each vehicle came out. That's when a tear rolled down my cheek. Tomorrow we go back in. We will continue to help wherever we are needed. And so ends this letter. For the United States of America, a country whose spirit and faith in the future stir the world, and for the people of America, whose soaring optimism, love of freedom and the worship of democracy continue to move and, and to inspire us, I hope for three things. I hope that the American people will rise to the challenge of overcoming destruction, comforting victims and rebuilding lives in the same spirit that has carried their nation forward since its founding, the spirit of hope, of courage and of great enterprise. I hope that as the United States readies itself to respond to the gauntlet thrown down by the merchants of terror, the virtues of tolerance and restraint that have bound the American polity and made it the most successful multicultural society on earth will bind ever more tightly and that Muslim communities within will not suffer as a result of the outrageous misdeeds of the few. And, Madam, and Madam Deputy President, I hope that the great loss of human life will not tempt Americans to lose their humanity. I hope that when a superpower weeps, its tears will anoint justice and not water vengeance, that the response will be measured and considered, that the perpetrators and their backers will be hunted down and made to account for their attack, 
but that no more innocent blood will be shed to add to that which has already soaked the ground of the Lower Manhattan and the Pentagon. Finally, Madam, President, Madam Deputy President, my thoughts go out to all my fellow Australians who lost loved ones. New York and Washington and Pittsburgh might be 15,000 miles from Australia, but they will never again be foreign soil to us. Their wounds will be our wounds, their memories will be our memories, and their pain will be ours too. Because every piece of ground, no matter how small or distant from these shores, upon which Australian blood has been shed, will always be a part of Australia. Senator Kearney. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, Madam Deputy President, as I, as I enter this debate, uh, I'm conscious of not being able to say uh, what uh, I ought to say in the way I want to say it. And uh, indeed, I'm not sure that uh, anybody could do that. But having uh, listened to television coverage of speeches in America, having listened today in the Great Hall to speeches, and having listened in this chamber to speeches, I think some people have come close to saying what ought to be said in the way uh, they want to and in the way which is most suitable. I'm conscious too, uh, Madam Deputy, that. Uh, that there is a need to make an attempt to say what ought to be said about the events of the 11th of September and their uh, aftermath. And the points I make are the points that have been made most eloquently before me. But first of all, I think we remember, remember those uh, people who were directly affected by those events, the uh, people killed. And I was just sitting here listening to the speeches and I was. Uh, <coughs> trying to visualise what it would be like. And if we were sitting in this chamber and the plane suddenly crashed, crashed through, uh, what would that mean to us? Would that mean death or uh, fearful injury in any event? Injury of uh, limb and mind and uh, devastation for our families and indeed devastation for the country because this is a a most symbolic uh, <coughs> building, Madam Deputy President. So we have the death and destruction that these events brought to people, to living flesh, to living bone and flesh, who, uh, who no doubt, uh, who no doubt, but people, I should say, who no doubt, confidently and with some uh, justification, expected a much longer term on earth than they were allowed, or a much longer term on earth without the pain and suffering that will now come to many of them. And Madam uh, Deputy President, uh, in addition to that, there's the, the insult, the insult to the, to the building and to the city uh, in the case of the, uh, of, the, of the Twin Towers, the World Trade Centre, the insult to, uh, to New York and, in the, uh, in the case of the Pentagon, the insult to Washington, the capital of the United States, and through, uh, through those cities, an insult to the nation as a whole. Uh, a, terrible, uh, a, terrible, a terrible affliction. And, uh, Madam Deputy President, I think it's proper and right that we... Uh, as a Senate and as a Parliament, recall those things and uh, express, in so far as that uh, can be expressed, the sorrow that uh, should be common to all who uh, are uh, of the human race. Uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, we're all uh, members of the human race. The issue, uh, the, or, the, or, the, um, or the reference to religion, has been strong throughout. Uh, Abraham uh, was the, uh, the father to, uh, to the three religions that are based on the, uh, the great books, the uh, books of, that we call the Bible, and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and then the Quran, 
So, uh, Madam Deputy President, when we speak uh, of uh, religion, we're speaking of a, a great tradition, and in the case of the, uh, of, of the three religions, uh, Islam, uh, Christianity and Judaism, we're speaking of uh, religions with a common source, and uh, a common source which would uh, produce in most common feelings that uh, we would describe as human feelings, as those feelings that uh, make, us, uh, make us decent uh, citizens of this world, of, uh, of uh, forces that are forces for good. I think that's to be remembered, and I think it's a great tribute uh, to, to the American people and I think it's been expressed by the president, but I think, uh, I think uh, anybody that was at the, uh, at the service in the Great Hall uh, would uh, say that the ambassador, Mr Schiffer, <coughs> expressed it very well, that uh, feeling that we are of a, uh, of a common stock and that we should go forward on that basis. Uh, Madam uh, Deputy, President, uh, it is well then to remember the people killed, the buildings destroyed, uh, the people injured, those who are closely connected by ties of kinship, kinship uh, whether they be brother or sister, husband or wife, grandfather or grandparents, people who lost, uh, who lost those associated with them in this, uh, in this destruction which took place on the 11th of, uh, 11th of September. Madam Deputy President, uh, <clears throat> I think everybody in the Senate would uh, treasure the opportunity to uh, say things about these events to join this debate. Uh, it um, was decided that uh, nobody, not, not everybody could do that. And uh, the, uh, my party, the Labor Party, has decided to have one representative from each state to speak, and uh, that's uh, been done. Uh, Senator Ferguson, uh, Senator, uh, uh, Senator, Senator Ferguson, of course not, should say, uh, Senator Faulkner uh, spoke, I thought, quite movingly, uh, and on behalf of New South, uh, South Wales, Senator Sherry on behalf of uh, uh, Tasmania, Senator Ludwig on behalf of uh, Queensland, uh, Senator Lundy on uh, behalf of the, uh, of the uh, Capital Territories, uh, and uh, myself on behalf of the Victorians, Senator Schott on behalf of the South Australians, and Senator Cook on behalf of the West Australians. So uh, could I just put that on record, Madam uh, Deputy President, to indicate that at our caucus meeting, there was a, uh, 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 the expression was that everybody would like to speak. That was not possible, but it ought to be put on record that uh, everybody sought the opportunity. So I feel uh, most privileged, Madam uh, Deputy uh, President, to be able to speak on, on behalf of uh, those Victorian members, and indeed on behalf of uh, Victoria generally. This is a, uh, uh, this is a very sad debate, arose out of uh, um, terrible events, very sad events. Uh, I don't know uh, how, how things like this are uh, redressed. Uh, it just does seem, it just does seem the most awful thing <clears> that people are almost powerless to, uh, to do much about it. I think that is why it's that sense of powerlessness. I think that is why people do turn uh, to religion and to the concept of God. Uh, some criticisms very subtly have been made of that. I think that's... Uh, uh, I, I'm, well, I, I'm not going to condemn anybody or make any adverse comments at all. I simply say that I do think religion can be a very powerful tool in these circumstances uh, to uh, give people hope to give people uh, <coughs> encouragement, to give people uh, uh, the opportunity to return to, uh, uh, to, to life in the full sense. 
I suppose those touched are going to be touched in the way that we're all touched when we uh, lose loved ones, when matters that are uh, of great importance to us are, uh, are torn apart, when symbols that are <coughs> dear to us are uh, desecrated. <coughs> We've all uh, had experience of things like that, never on a not on a scale such as is uh, not on, not on a scale such as uh, uh, is present here, but nevertheless gives us some idea of, uh, of, of the tragedy that's occurred. So, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President, can I, along with everybody who's so far spoken today, having spoken so eloquently, and, on, and uh, in common with many, many people around the world that's spoken about these things, express uh, uh, my uh, uh, sympathy. That sounds a very inadequate word, a very inadequate word indeed, for those that have suffered. And as people have pointed out, uh, these events have touched our shores in a very, very uh, significant way and have touched the, uh, the shores of many countries around the world. And uh, <coughs> the response has been, uh, has been common and I think uh, uh, most moving and I think most fitting. Senator Ridgway. Oh, Senator, Senator Ridgway is the next I've got on the speaker's list. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I want to share in the voices in expressing my deepest sympathy and condolences to the families and friends of those who lost their lives under such tragic circumstances in New York, Washington and Pennsylvania on September the 11th. I also on this occasion condemn such insanity as indefensible and nothing good ever comes of madness and justice is rarely ever found in the sad experiences of the ruins of such violence. We of course from time to time may differ but ultimately we aspire to the same end goal of peace and prosperity and a future for all of our people, for all of our races and particularly for all of our young people. And we would not wish death upon anybody, but I rest assured that those who have lost their lives under these circumstances have met death with the absolute hope of immortality. Even in the face of discouragement or seeming defeat, I would hope that there remains a confidence to shake it off and stand firm and resolute in our belief of world security, peace and tolerance. And it's in this regard that I wish to strongly uh, voice our concerns and our moral obligations, not just to support our American brothers and sisters, but to also call for tolerance and unity within our own nation. In our quest for exacting justice, we should ensure that justice is exact, not discriminate. And first and foremost, as Australians who pride ourselves on tolerance and cultural diversity, we must condemn swiftly attacks by Australians on Muslim mosques and schools and businesses in the same manner in which we have condemned anti-Semitic comments in this country. Many of our Muslim and Arab friends, not unlike our Jewish friends, are Australian citizens and deserve our support in such a harrowing time. And no Australian should feel under threat of abuse or be spat on or be stoned just because they are Muslim. We as Australians pride ourselves on democracy and its fundamental freedoms. And most of all, we must hold the rule of law and guarantee the right of freedom of every citizen in this nation without fear or favour. Intolerance is a global struggle, exacting a requirement that we not vilify people for who they are but take, take precise action that guarantees punishment to those for the evil deeds that they have done, not just because they resemble someone or are different. It's times like this that genuine morality is preserved only in the school of adversity. And in this regard, let us not be bereft of advocates in this nation for tolerance, but advocates for freedom and democracy and exact justice and tolerance and understanding for all of the members of the family of humanity. I finish by again expressing our deeper sympathy and condolences to the families and friends of those who tragically died. Thank you, Senator Kemp. Thank you, um, Deputy President. Uh, uh, I rise to uh, support the condolence uh, motion before this chamber and never, let me say, have I ever seen a, a greater unity of uh, purpose uh, in, in the Senate and indeed in this uh, parliament. 
Indeed, uh, this is a reflection of the response uh, I believe we are seeing in the wider world uh, community. As uh, today's headline in the Melbourne Age uh, was headed, uh, World US Unite in Fight Against Terror. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, all of us hope uh, that uh, these appalling events can be dealt with in a timely and quick manner. But history warns us uh, that the, the battle uh, against evil uh, may be long and difficult, but is a, it is a battle which uh, democracy and freedom must ultimately prevail. It is vital that in uh, these testing times we maintain the unity that all of us have spoken about um, today. All of us will be able to uh, recall in the years to come uh, where we were when we first heard of the attacks on the World Trade Centre in Lower Manhattan. Uh, we switched on the TV and the appalling tragedy unfolded uh, before our eyes. We watched uh, as the world watched and saw events so horrifying that uh, they are almost uh, impossible to comprehend. Uh, two passenger airliners um, crashing, crashing into skyscrapers filled with people. People jumping to their deaths from the upper floors of those buildings to escape the inferno. The devastating collapse of the two of the world's most uh, massive building structures. Another passenger airline crashing into the Pentagon and yet another into a field in Pennsylvania. We saw remarkable acts of heroism. Hundreds of emergency workers have lost their lives by volunteering to go into places of the greatest danger as they sought to help the thousands of trapped people. It appears, uh, as many have uh, mentioned today, that more than 5,000 uh, people have lost their lives uh, in these attacks. Reports in the press today indicate uh, that some 69 Australians are among those feared dead. Twelve of these people have come from my home state of Victoria. And this was, I think, the very point the Prime Minister was making uh, when he said, at no stage should any Australian regard this as something that is just confined to the United States. It is an attack upon the way of life we hold dear in common with the Americans. The thoughts and the prayers of this parliament have appropriately turned to the grieving families of those men and women whose lives were tragically ended in an unspeakable terror. But the search for survivors goes on, and although hope is fading, uh, hope still remains. In this disaster, people have found the strength to go on. And I was moved uh, to read the story of a 25-year-old James uh, Dorney, an Australian um, who was in the South Tower of the World Trade Center and survived the attack. As the Herald Sun reported, uh, this is the story of James uh, Dorney. With 20 flights to go, the fit rugby player said he was stuffed, but he knew he had to help the older and less healthy ones keep going. He held their hands, lifting them in the heat. Everyone was pulling each other uh, though, and yelling, come on, let's get out of here and just don't give up. And uh, James Dorney went on to say, I grabbed this girl next to me and said, we're going to make it. I didn't actually believe it myself, but it sort of sounded good at the time. And he went on to say, I will never forget the fire guys uh, going the other way into the building. I was so terrified. They were the, the bravest, most beautiful people. Like many, I was greatly moved by the address of the American ambassador gave at the memorial service uh, in Parliament House today. And let me just quote one extract from his speech. Americans, he said, are not a vengeful people. Our nation is founded on the principles of liberty and justice. We are free to choose our faith, free to choose our creed, free to choose the means that will comfort our souls and the souls of others. No, we are not a vengeful people, but we are a people who love justice. We will not strike out at the innocent. We will not end the lives of good men and women for no good reason. We will find those responsible for this dastardly deed and we will bring them to justice. But the terrorists ultimately failed. These acts uh, did not and will not, I believe, crush the spirit of the American people or, or of their friends and allies in Australia. As Dr Kessinger uh, said today, 
The terrorists have already lost an important battle. In the US, they, um, they will face a united people determined to eradicate the evil of ter terrorism at any cost. And he continued to say, all Western democracies have recognised that an, the assault on America, if unpunished, is a prelude to what can happen even more easily in their own societies. Uh, Australia shall go forward uh, with America and the world community. We stand, as the Prime Minister has said, uh, shoulder to shoulder to defend freedom and rid the world of terror. This motion today uh, before this chamber shows that the Ambassador was right when he said Australians and Americans march again as brothers and sisters in freedom. Senator O'Brien. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, on behalf of Senator Crowley, who is in New York at the moment, I seek leave to tender a uh, contribution for incorporation to the Hansard. Is leave granted to incorporate as requested? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Allison. Thank you, Madam President. I add my words of deepest regret to the deaths of, uh, for the deaths of thousands of Americans, Australians and citizens of so many other countries. Like others, I watched the events unfolding on television in stunned horror and I felt for the victims and their families. And it is appropriate that the Senate should pass this motion of condolence for all of the reasons put forward by other senators. I don't wish to detract from the earnestness with which the Senate expresses its deep sorrow and anger, but I do feel compelled to speak out about what I think is a great fear amongst Australians, that we will be drawn into another terrible and useless war. Item 7 of the motion could be seen uh, merely as a commitment to finding and punishing those responsible, but this is not what I hear uh, or have heard in the rhetoric of the last week. The United States President has said this is an act of war and that it will be a long and arduous fight. Mr Howard says it's an act of war against Australia too and we've already committed a Navy uh, vessel to the region. Prime Minister and Mr Beasley were also quick to say this attack was a reason Australia's borders should be more secure against asylum seekers. I think it's illogical and divisive to link these uh, people fleeing from persecution in Afghanistan with the calculated act of unthinkable aggression. These terrorists didn't set out in leaky boats. The suicide pilots were free to travel in the States, and it seems they were in fact trained there too. The war on terrorism is not going to be an easy one. Those responsible for directly taking this action are already dead. I don't want to see Australia commit its capabilities to any war. My greatest fear is that this will be another useless waste of human life, perhaps a repeat of the Iraqi war in which thousands of civilians were killed whilst the perpetrator remained elusive. Sanctions and daily bombing are killing thousands of uh, civilians in Iraq even now. If it is established to the satisfaction of America that Afghanistan is the country which harbours the prime suspect, does that mean that Australia will join America in killing as many Afghanis as it takes before Osama bin Laden is handed over? It's difficult for me to say this in a condolence motion, and I wish that item 7 in the motion did not make it necessary, but I think that before we consider military action, we must take a long, hard look at the situation which gave rise to this horrendous attack. I don't want to suggest there could ever, ever be any justification for this kind of action. There is not. But if we are to make the world safe from terrorism, we need to understand how terrorists operate, what gives rise to the action and the political uh, context in which it has happened. And we cannot be selective about history even at times like this. The rise of fundamentalism and the Taliban in Afghanistan has its roots in world power interference. I'm enormously relieved that the might of the U US military wasn't used immediately in a counter-attack, and I hope this restraint continues. The destructive repercussions of a war in this region could indeed be terrible. I urge the government to confine this motion to one of heartfelt and deep regret for those who've died and been injured. It should be a motion which everyone in this place can easily support, without the suggestion that the Senate supports an Australian call to arms. Senator Crossan. I rise on behalf of all my constituents in the Northern Territory to offer my deepest condolences to those families whose lives have been so tragically shattered with the events of the past week. I want to also offer my thoughts of sincere concern and support to those who wait for any news of their loved one, their workmate or their friend. This is a tragedy of unspeakable dimensions and millions of people around the globe will have watched these graphic events in stunned disbelief and sorrow. 
This is an attack on democracy and freedom and a display of terror on innocent victim victims which was never warranted. This display of hatred and anger strikes at the heart of those of us who value justice and democracy, and there are many of us in those countries around this world. Thousands of people have fought long and hard to maintain these values and are proud of this. But this incredible act of violence has made us all stand strong beside each other in the family of democracy and has highlighted the courage of the people in America to reaffirm these principles and to commit to rebuild their society. When a terrorist in this world decides to attack one of us, he attacks all of us in, in uh, those of us who believe in democracy and freedom. People in the Northern Territory have faced a number of natural disasters over many years on a large scale, disasters which have made this country watch helplessly as their lives have changed forever. Cyclone Tracy, the Catherine floods of 98 are two but of these. And these events have nurtured a sense of community and strength amongst people in the Territory. Territorians understand how hard it is to rebuild and recreate the society in which you live and the enormous challenges which this brings, and therefore will have some understanding of what the people in New York are facing. But unlike the people in New York, these events are in fact uh, an international crime, and a crime of this proportion makes it difficult to understand why. People are angry and are searching for answers as to why there is such anger and hatred and disrespect for ordinary people who were simply doing their job and playing their role in society. The Northern Territory is a very multicultural and harmonious community. Up to 64 people from different, uh, uh, sorry, up to 64 nationalities uh, from different people around the world have made their homes there, many of whom are Christians, Jews or Muslims. And people on Christmas in Cocos Island, whom I represent uh, in the electorate the Northern Territory have a large population of Muslims who have also been affected by not only the events of the last week but of the last few months. My electorate is testimony to the fact that many nationalities can live together in a spirit of community and peace, and it is important that those in our community who are Muslims are not the source of people's anger or become a target for retaliation. Last week we witnessed the worst single act of terrorism and evil that has occurred in our lifetime, an event that I was hoping my children and grandchild would never have to witness or try to understand. My deepest sympathy goes to all those people whose lives have been forever affected by these events. My gratitude for the courage shown by those assisting in this operation, be they firemen, medics, police or volunteers, my admiration for the people of America in regaining their strength in the face of this most dreadful event, and my support, along with all people in the Northern Territory, in joining with the rest of the world in finding those responsible for this atrocity and for bringing them to justice. Senator Gibson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I rise to support the government's uh, motion on, on this matter. Um, and all of us are, of course, upset about it. Uh, today I, I came to the chamber to talk to uh, about uh, a personal vignette uh, of, this, of this incident. Uh, my youngest son, David, is an analyst uh, working in New York, works for Macquarie Bank, and uh, he woke us the other night to say, uh, uh, Dad, I'm, I'm ringing to say I'm, uh, uh, I'm OK, because uh, we hadn't been watching the news. And, uh, and I said, well, of course you're OK. I'm talking to you. He said, no, but listen, this is what's happened in New York. And he said, I ring you now because uh, when you wake up in the morning, the phones will be jammed and you won't be able to chase me. So I'm going to let you know I'm OK. So I thanked him and he said, oh, I saw, I was at a meeting at half past eight this morning in another building. He, he works in actually mid Manhattan. And we saw the first, saw a plane go, go, going the wrong way down the, down the river. And I said, gee, that's strange. So you see, we watched it go down heading towards the World Trade Center. And that was the first plane. But the bit I wanted to actually put on record in the Senate uh, this afternoon is from another, a colleague of his, Rory Robertson, who sits opposite David in the same office, 
Rory is Macquarie's uh, interest analyst, and uh, I've been fortunate enough for the last uh, year or so, uh, been on his distribution list for his, uh, for his emails, which come out a couple of times a week about interest rates and the economy in the USA uh, and their relevance uh, also to, to Australia. Uh, Rory was in the, was in the World Trade Centre uh, when the first plane hit, and, and if I just read out uh, the relevant bit of, uh, of his email, um, it's an interesting story. Uh, this is my, and I quote, this is my account, Rory Robertson, this is my account of some of the terrible things that happened in New York t City today, followed by some thoughts on the financial market implications. Like many others, I was way too close to the action. I am pretty shaken, although uh, not, have, not even a scratch. Thank you to all those who called to see that I'm okay. At about 8.40 a.m., we were on the ground floor of the World Trade Center, Marriott, listening to the breakfast speaker on NABE, National Association for Business and Economics, conference, when what turned out to be the first hijacked plane hit our tower. There was a bit of a bang and the building shook. We all looked at each other across the table wondering, earthquake? Presumably ev everyone else was also thinking about the 110 floors above us. Then the, then the building shook again. Everyone ran for the door and then the foyer. The, the, the move was reasonably orderly. I noticed dust and smoke coming from one lift well. Probably it was a bomb, as in 1993, I thought. I was terrified, but okay. Everyone was keen to go into the street, but we didn't really know how, to, how frightened to be. On getting to the foyer, you could see the debris outside on the ground. Hotel officials told people not to go outside, as things might still be crashing down. Maybe five minutes later, people moved outside, and we could see the hole near the top of the building and the fire. It was mind-numbing sight. Thousands of people were spilling out into the street from buildings in the financial district, but none of us had much idea what had happened. Someone said it was a missile. Another said a helicopter had crashed into the tower, so it might have been an accident. I didn't have a clue what to do. I, quest I, I guessed the conference was over, and growing crowds were milling around. Like everyone else, I kept looking up, marvelling at the hole and the fire near the top of the tower. I didn't see people jumping out, but many were talking about it. I noticed a car torn in half, and an engine that seemed to have flown out of nowhere. I tried to ring Gwen and Matt, uh, they know I was at the meeting today, to let them know I was okay. The mobile wouldn't work, but eventually Gwen got through and she, Bloomberg, Matt, had worked uh, for me. I tried to ring my brother in Brisbane, the mobile wouldn't, walk, wouldn't work. I figured I would walk downtown away from the WTC and then walk to Midtown via the east side. As I started to move away, I observed debris here and there, the sorts of thing you would expect when a passenger plane explodes. I was maybe 250 yards from the WTC when I looked up and saw the second plane fly directly, maybe 150 yards above me. Instantly, I knew I was going to hit, it was going to hit the tower. I didn't watch, I didn't see it hit. I just ran, maybe 50 yards towards the alley, behind a building, terrified that the debris would easily carry to where I stood. As I ran, I heard the explosion of the second hit. I made the alley and hugged the near side of the building. My thought was that the building was high enough to block out any flying objects. But looking around the alley, I could see bits and pieces from the first plane. A young Japanese woman stumbled into the alley, crying and very distressed. We hung it against the wall. I put my arm around her shoulder and told her what we, that we were safe, at the same time hoping that we were. It was like being in the middle of a disaster movie. It was hard to credit what was unfolding all around. After waiting a few minutes, I started walking quickly to the bottom of the island, before heading east and then uptown. Looking over my left shoulder, I could see the holes in the two towers and the fires. My head was still spinning, the people in the streets were watching, some crying, most stunned. One guy walked beside me, he said the year was just now at war. I said it, it would have been a terrorist group, not a nation that had attacked. He said it didn't matter. My brother Alistair called and I said I was fine. He asked if the buildings were still standing, I said yeah, marvelling how little the first tower had shaken, given that it was hit by an airliner. I was nearly back to Midtown when someone said that, that the tower had collapsed. I said no, it was hit by two planes. He said, no, the tower had collapsed. I got home and watched the second tower collapse on live on TV. I also saw replays of the plane that had flown above me. Scary. Anyway, I just thought I should put on record um, details from an Australian living, living in New York who was actually uh, in the tower at the time. Thank you. Senator Murray. Thank you, Madam President. I wish to join uh, this motion of uh, condolence and support and in doing so, I want to make it clear that I don't only speak for myself, uh, but for my wife and family, who have been very moved uh, by these events. Uh, all of us struggle for the words to express uh, our feelings about these matters. Um, 
I can quite freely say that I remained in shock uh, for the entire night uh, that this uh, first uh, broke upon us, and I was unable really to make any remark at all, but just stare with absolute incredulity at the, uh, at the television set uh, as I heard the unfolding horror. Uh, I have been amazed, uh, as one e inevitably is uh, by human beings, uh, at the strength and fortitude of the American people. Uh, I think they've done astonishingly well uh, given the uh, appalling circumstances uh, of this terrorist attack. I've also been very impressed by the Australian people. Uh, I know we fear um, those who will lash out blindly at uh, those of another race or another religion, um, but I have the uh, general impression that uh, Australians have conducted themselves um, well in a situation where uh, at least 70, perhaps more, uh, are missing or dead. And I offer uh, as an Australian parliamentarian, my sincere condolences uh, to them as well. There are a, a number of parliamentarians and many Australians who've had the honour of ser serving in the armed forces of Australia and of other countries. Uh, there are fewer, thank goodness, who have served in conditions of war. Uh, I am one of those, and. I wish to refer to that briefly uh, because I think it has relevance in these times um, when people may take exaggerated positions. Uh, I was uh, a person who supported majority rule in Southern Africa, in my country of Rhodesia at that time. However, I was a volunteer and served with the Rhodesian Air Force um, from 1969 to 1977 as a territorial member. I have seen war. I know the smell and look of death, and I have heard the screams of wounded and injured people. And it's not something to be embarked on lightly. And what we're going to face here is this action will produce, and quite rightly, a counteraction and this thing will go on for some time until it's eventually finished. And therefore, when we consider our role as an ally of the United States and as a friend of all democracies and of all free peoples, we must also remember that it is our responsibility to observe the rules of war and to ensure that retaliation is just and is directed and is not random and arbitrary. I have uh, confidence that our own uh, government and our parliament uh, will see to that side of things. I know there are people who are a little afraid, for instance, of Clause 7 of uh, this motion. I personally fully support Clauses 1 to 8, and I fully support the words within them, because I do expect the Australian government whether it be a coalition government or a Labour government, uh, to act in the full interests uh, of this country and to return to their parliament when it is necessary to consider matters in the national interest, including the deployment of troops. Um, but I do want to say uh, that I would caution care in those who have not known war, care in the expression of, uh, of themselves, uh, care in their advocacy, because what we need here is a considered uh, professional and moral response to an outrageous, evil, and moral, immoral act. Um, and in so doing, um, whilst I uh, put across, I guess, uh, a note of caution, I want to make it clear that I'm not a pacifist, and I think that these actions uh, have to be returned with vigour. Senator Ferguson. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, thank you, Madam President. And I rise to support and strongly support the, this motion that's before the Senate today. Um, <clears throat> as many of you are well aware, uh, I spent some three and a half months in New York just prior to Christmas. And during that time, uh, people often asked me to describe New York and what it was really like. 
And uh, the words that came to my mind and to my wife's mind were often vibrant, uh, busy, alive and safe. One of the words that was often used by us is that New York today was a safe city. Uh, many times uh, after dark, my wife would walk down 2nd Avenue on her, on her own and said she felt safer in many streets of New York than she did in her, in her own home city. And uh, I remember that quite vividly uh, in, in my memories of New York. And I particularly also uh, have memories of all of the Australians that I came to contact with who are working in New York. Amongst those, of course, was Senator Gibson's son, David, uh, who was there while we were there, but also uh, a considerable number of other uh, Australians who are working and living in New York, and some who regarded us as, it as home, and some who regarded themselves as Australians in New York. And my wife was particularly uh, involved in Australian Women in New York, a group that meet together on a regular basis. And uh, I was very saddened to read that uh, of at least one member of that group that uh, was actually killed in the Twin Towers uh, collapse. And so um, I'm very conscious and uh, couldn't help but uh, feel very strongly when I saw the graphic uh, reporting of what was happening in New York, having spent so many times uh, walking down those streets. Um, can I say that also, um, as far as the motion is concerned, I think the motion should, should be supported in its entirety exactly as it is. I cannot believe that anybody could find, uh, in a very carefully worded uh, seventh clause in this, in this, uh, in this motion, that, that it fully endorses the commitment of the Australian government to support within Australia's capabilities United States-led action against those responsible for the attacks. There's no, there's no mention in this motion about all-out uh, indiscriminate bombing. There's no mention about all-in all in indiscriminate attacks against people who certainly uh, were not involved with these attacks. And when I read Senator Brown's uh, amendments um, and, and have heard of some of the Democrats who, who want to withdraw um, the seventh clause of this motion, uh, we're often accused in government of making politics or, or causing, uh, making some political advantage out of events that happen. I mean, I looked at Senator Brown's amendments, and he talks about urges world leaders to respond for cries for revenge with calm and reason. I can't think of any more calm and reasoned and response, response than that taken by President Bush and the, Australian, and the American administration to this date. Here we are six days after the event took place, and still the American people, while grieving in the way that uh, we would expect them to grieve, there has been no indiscriminate response. It has been a calm and reasoned uh, response to what has happened to those events. And uh, when, it, when uh, Senator Brown and his amendments uh, urges them to respond with calm and reason, that's exactly what's happening. Um, and, then we get, um, and then we get to the other matters, which, of course, he adds where I simply just simply do not support the things that he's saying, and I am inclined to uh, declare my enthusiastic support for the condolence motion as it is moved in clause seven. Um, I've often one of my favourite saying is it's a good job we don't know what's around the corner, uh, and I think that it is a good job in, in events such as this horrific events which just shake the very foundations of our beliefs and those things we believe in. Um, if we did know what was around the corner, it would make life very, very difficult of us. But I cannot help feeling uh, extreme sorrow for, for over 5,000 people, it seems, destroyed in one unwanted, indiscriminate, horrendous crime, because it is a crime. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing short of that. And if we allow terrorism to rule our lives uh, internationally, then uh, I think it will, it will be, the world would be a much worse place uh, than some of the things that we think that are not so perfect in the world of today. And so I, I believe that the American response to, to what has happened in New York has been one of reason, it has been one of calm, and I certainly hope that, uh, that when action does take place amongst those uh, who are responsible for the tragic attack that took place or the tragic attacks that took place last Tuesday, that it will be done with all the might possible to make sure that we try and ensure that such events don't occur again. I heard people talk about uh, uh, attending to world poverty and all of the other things which, are, uh, which you know, cause all of these things to happen. The world is always looking at world poverty 
because we know that the one way that we can improve the uh, conditions of people living in the world is to improve their education, which will enable them to somehow get out of the poverty trap. But when we come to a serious situation such as that, to try and attach all of these other things onto a condolence motion for a little bit of short-term political expediency, uh, I think, uh, demeans the people that are proposing them. And uh, I have th this resolution be before the Senate has my absolute and total support, uh, and can I extend my, my sympathy to anybody who in any way was, uh, had been affected by this tragedy, whether it's by loss of a loved one or loss of their innocence. Thank you. Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Madam President. I'd also like to uh, lend my support to the um, expressions of horror and the conveyance of sympathy contained within this motion, both to uh, people of the USA and, of course, the uh, families and uh, loved ones of those Australians who have been uh, killed. Uh, in this um, uh, dreadful attack, which uh, should be condemned, and indeed the Democrats uh, are already on the record and are on the record um, the uh, day following the, the attacks through uh, our leader, uh, Senator Stott Despoir, supporting expressions of condolence by the Prime Minister and uh, supporting calls by the US President to bring the perpetrators to justice. Uh, and it is appropriate that uh, this Senate and this Parliament pass motions. Uh, of condolence, of sympathy and of uh, condemnation of these attacks. Uh, it is worth pointing out, particularly in light of the comments uh, just made by Senator Ferguson, that uh, paragraph 7 uh, does not relate to a condolence motion uh, at all. It specifically talks about uh, committing, uh, potentially committing uh, Australian Defence Forces and troops. And I think uh, whilst that is an appropriate topic to consider, it is appropriate to consider separately rather than in the context of a condolence motion. And I think that is the, uh, the point that uh, the, the Democrats have been making. The um, point number eight of the motion is one that I uh, would like to specifically note as well in encouraging all Australians in the wake of these appalling events to display those very qualities of tolerance and inclusion which the terrorists themselves have assaulted. And of course, we have unfortunately seen some displays of intolerance in the Australian community and some deliberate attempts by um, some in the media to inflame that intolerance. And we've seen the uh, quite uh, terrible attacks on uh, some in the Muslim community in various parts of Australia, including in my hometown of Brisbane, a, a bus of school children being a, uh, from a Muslim school being stoned. Um, by, uh, by various people as it went by, and I think attacks like that uh, should be uh, strongly condemned and uh, opposed uh, absolutely. And it is worth highlighting when we are talking about the uh, role of, of tyranny, tyranny and uh, uh, oppression and terrorism uh, in various parts of the world that, of course, what Australians and uh, people in the United States and people, of course, of many other nations uh, have had to uh, experience in such a terrible way a week ago is uh, similar to what many people uh, in other parts of the world have been experiencing, have had to face that same tyranny and oppression uh, and uh, abomination and criminal acts, uh, including from regimes such as the Taliban. Uh, and in that context, I think it is worth emphasising uh, that in the same way as we express support and sympathy for those who were the victims of this uh, terrorist and tyrannical attack uh, and look for ways to uh, ensure that those that um, commit such acts are brought to justice and uh, the victims of those acts are supported. Uh, we should also lend our support to others who are fleeing such persecution, uh, including those, of course, that arrive on our shores uh, fleeing such tyranny and persecution. I think that uh, we should look to take the same approach uh, to others uh, who are suffering and have suffered for many years uh, in the face of similar persecution, possibly in some cases from the same people or groups of people who have uh, committed this latest uh, abomination. The Democrats also emphasise that in any response, as I think many have said in this debate, a response that should be measured uh, and reasoned uh, and balanced. Uh, that such responses should include and incorporate the role of the United Nations and, of course, in noting the role of ANZUS in, uh, uh, and the uh, ANZUS Treaty that has been noted in this resolution, it should be highlighted that the UN is a central part of that ANZUS Treaty 
and uh, it should not be assumed that ANZUS is simply uh, a, um, uh, a treaty that involves Australia and US alone these days, uh, that it does also require the involvement of the United Nations and the United Nations should be centrally involved in uh, any response in relation to this, whether through ANZUS or through other um, multilateral activities. In some ways, I believe we can hope that the uh, range of global cooperation that may occur in, in, as a consequence of this action uh, might well serve to provide uh, mechanisms for greater cooperation across a range of areas, and uh, you know, that should perhaps include supporting those others in parts of the world who are victims of or subject of tyranny and oppression uh, by regimes that do not respect human rights and do uh, seek out uh, and uh, wreak uh, death on innocent people. So uh, in speaking in, in support of those other parts of this motion, the, uh, I'd reinforce the support of my party, the Democrats, and of course our leader in expressing support and condolence for all those who have suffered as a result of these attacks. Uh, including, of course, the, uh, the people of the, the United States, but uh, also noting the large numbers of Australians who are grieving uh, enormously today. And I'd also like to note um, uh, Andrew Knox as one of those, someone else, someone that I also knew, not as well as others, but uh, did know from previous contact. And if we just look at him as just one person uh, and the enormous uh, ability and, and talent and uh, contribution that he uh, was making and the, the potential that he had to bring so much positiveness to the world in the future and then multiply that uh, by the 70 or more Australians and uh, the potential of their contribution to the world that has now been lost and multiply that again to the thousands uh, who also have had the opportunity for contributing in a positive way to the world uh, that has now been lost. We can see the enormity uh, of this crime and the enormity of the loss that, that many of us, that all of us feel at this time. Uh, so I join in uh, supporting the condolences of others. I note the, uh, the support of my entire party for that and uh, the, the calls by uh, all of the Democrats for a, uh, a measured response and a response by the community at large as well as governments that supports uh, tolerance and inclusiveness of all in our community and supports a need for supporting all those who are the victims of persecution and terror throughout the world. Pain. Thank you, Madam President. I rise to make uh, some brief remarks uh, also on this condolence motion. I think that the service held in the Great Hall earlier today, bringing together almost all members and senators who are able to attend, uh, the leaders of our nation, representatives of the international community in Canberra, this building's community itself and the Canberra community was a particularly fitting way for this parliament to acknowledge the particular horror that has been wrought by terrorism in the United States last week, not just wrought on Americans, but on the citizens of almost 40 other nations, including, of course, our own. I want to note particularly and thank uh, particularly the United States ambassadors, uh, Ambassador Tom Schieffer's, Tom Schieffer for his words. I think you could have heard a pin drop in the Great Hall, and it's not all that often that you can actually say that. And his message was a particularly powerful and evocative one that will ring in many of our ears for days to come. All of our sympathies and mine particularly I wish to note are with the families of those who were killed and those who are still missing. And to the families of those Australians involved, I particularly recalled my heartfelt sympathies. Madam President, I've been struck, I think, in the last uh, week, almost a week now, by how technology now changes our appreciation of these events. I think it's useful to reflect for just a moment on the impact of technology's delivery of this horror via CNN or the BBC directly into our homes. And its impact worldwide, therefore, is absolutely extraordinary in a way in which such horrors previously were not. And the impact that has on people's minds and their conceptions of such events changes uh, as a result. Think even of the emails that were sent by people in the World Trade Centre who reported the attacks to friends and to families and said that they thought they'd get down safely enough but were caught in the maelstrom of the building's collapse. Think of the mobile telephone calls made by those on hijacked planes in deciding what they were to do with uh, the few moments left to them. The calls made on mobile phones from some of those trapped, which in fact led to some being rescued. 
the immediacy of, of the events is perhaps what, um, what has really struck me in the last um, few days. I've also wondered, reading some of the media and looking at some of the tapes, what young Australians are thinking when they're looking at, uh, at these events. When they look past the horror, when they hear the media and the debate, they may well do things in the area in which I work um, predominantly, Greater Western Sydney, look around their schools and they see themselves sitting with school friends from so many different cultural backgrounds, many probably Muslim, and they ponder these different events in the United States, what it might mean for them and their future. And we need to make sure that the diversity and the tolerance which has enabled Australia to build our strong modern community continues. We need to note that these are not crimes of Islam. These are crimes of individual criminals. And Australia needs to ensure that our community works together and stays together as we fight with the United States this war against terrorism. I want to particularly note the contribution, the enormous contribution of so many of the rescuers, some part of the normal emergency services teams of a city like New York or Washington or uh, in the area of Pennsylvania, uh, some volunteers but particularly police and fire department officers who face danger in their everyday work, and their families know that. But rarely, thankfully, do they face anything at all like this. And some have paid, too many have paid for their job with their lives. Like those who are simply going about their daily job uh, who paid the ultimate penalty on the morning of September the 11th. And I look at some of this, Madam President, through the eyes of uh, an extraordinary Australian woman who uh, is a person I admire, love and respect enormously. An Australian New Yorker friend, if you like, who uh, left Australia in 1987, the day after she was married, I think, and has walked, worked in the financial system in the United States ever since. She's currently here because her father is very unwell and she's come back to visit him. But her friends, the people she worked with for years at Cantor Fitzgerald and similar companies, were people in the World Trade Centre, and I can't imagine how she feels watching it from this distance, watching her city in this, uh, in this state, watching something that is nothing short of barbarism, in fact. And it seems to me that the perpetrators, as many have said this afternoon, must be carefully, logically identified, pursued and punished. Because their efforts to destroy the fabric of the community of the United States with their attacks in New York, in Washington and Pennsylvania won't succeed. The world community, the Australian community, have rallied behind the United States in this battle against terrorism. And in fact, I believe that is where our strength lies, in that cohesion that we have to protect the fundamental freedoms of this world, which will ensure that those freedoms are what takes us forward, not the sort of barbarism that's been perpetrated that can only take us backwards. Senator Crane. Thank you. Uh, Madam President. Um, until the events of last Tuesday, the thing that I remember most starkly in my life was the assassination of uh, the then President of the United States, uh, John F. Kennedy. And that occurred in a situation, um, I guess, where we were travelling from our parents' farm to our new land block and our truck broke down. We happened to be on the side of the road in the middle of the night and we had a small radio and we turned it on and my brother and myself heard every word of it. Last week, on the Tuesday, I was in very different circumstances. I was actually at a dinner of a very good friend of yours, Madam President, uh, the Speaker of the Singaporean Parliament. And uh, we were there with, and he sends his best regards, I must add that too, uh, Mr Tan Su Kun. Uh, present at that dinner was Mr Charles Chong and his wife, Mrs Chong, uh, Mr Sin Boon An, uh, Dr Livy Neo, uh, and her husband, Dr Ben Neo, and uh, representatives from uh, the, or the assistant clerk of the parliament there and our supporter. Also from Australia uh, was Mr Gary Neal and his wife Sue, Alan Morris, uh, Tanya Plevisek, Rick Williams, who was our secretary, uh, Paolo, who was a representative supporting the Australian delegation, and myself and my wife Thea. The first we heard was uh, Sin Boon Ann received a phone call from his family saying America had been attacked. And of course, immediately, we did not believe it. But then uh, some further information came in, and uh, I guess by weight of information, we had to believe it. 
Uh, Thera and I then went up after some discussion, went up and CNN was on. And as we walked in the door, a voice on the television said, here comes another plane. And we saw the second plane uh, fly straight into that building. Now, I can't find words to describe that. I think the most horrific thing for me in terms of that was when we saw the people jumping out of those stories so high from the ground and the fact that they had a choice of crash to their death by jumping out the window or off the ledge or being uh, incinerated in an inferno. Um, I hope I never see anybody having to make that choice again in those circumstances. Um, it left us um, totally bewildered. We then had further discussion with our hosts and of course everybody was you know, wondering what to do next, what was going to happen. And after some discussion, we decided the events that we just witnessed, albeit on a, a screen, uh, was probably as significant or would become more significant uh, than Pearl Harbor. And I, I have to say our Singaporean friends, uh, who are incredibly good hosts and kept us very, very busy, shared the same concerns and the same thoughts uh, as we as Australians did at that particular time. Now, I guess in some ways I was fortunate to be in another country and to share that with one of our very, very good allies. Having said that, I want to say I support uh, the motion in its totality before us today. I offer my sincere condolences to all, and particularly the Australian families who have lost their loved ones or are still waiting, trying to find out uh, if there's any hope for, the, for those who are missing. I particularly want to pay a tribute to the firefighters, police officers, volunteers, particularly those who went in to save and then paid the ultimate sacrifice themselves. They didn't get out. I want to mention those in the planes. To board a plane, to go about doing your, uh, your job and be sacrificed by fanatics is not acceptable in a civilised world. I want to say to the President of the United States, George W. Bush, I admire his humility and grace, his, his strength in the hour of need in the US, his resolution in tracking down those responsible, his acknowledgement that virtually all people of all faiths, including Muslims, are good law-abiding uh, and peace-loving citizens. And I think that comment he made then is incredibly important in the response to these fanatics. His statement so clear that if you were part of this atrocity, if you made it your business to be involved, we are coming to get you. Further, if you are a country who is harbouring terrorists, you are in our shortlist. In my view, a very appropriate response. The response is overwhelming from the free world is consistent that we must respond with clear decisiveness to destroy this attack on innocent people, on freedom, on liberty, on justice, on democracy. It is essential Australia play its part in making the boarding of a plane a safe occupation without risk of becoming a human bomb, in making sure that people can go to work without fear of fanatics flying aeroplanes into buildings. The quality of our civilisation in the future depends on the quality of the free world's response. I believe the response of our Prime Minister in the United States last week was carried out with humility, dignity, was most appropriate and did Australia proud at this difficult time. I particularly support Clause 6 of the resolution and reject Senator Brown's amendments and Senator Stott de Spoyer's comments on this part of the resolution. Finally, today at that service, the America, American ambassador, Mr Thomas Schieffer, all I can say is what an address. So strong, purposeful, a statement of faith. I could not do better than to end my contribution by repeating his last two lines. God bless Australia. God bless America. Senator Brandis. Madam President, I wish in speaking to this condolence motion to 
associate myself with the remarks of other government and opposition senators, and in particular with those of the Leader of the Government, Senator Hill, and the Leader of the Opposition, Senator Faulkner. I unhesitatingly support all eight paragraphs of the motion. When events so shocking and awesome as those of the 11th of September 2001 erupt in our lives, mere words are such poor things to convey the depth and measure of our feelings. Our anger at the evil, our disbelief at the sheer scale of the event, our pity for the victims and sorrow for their families, our admiration for the heroism of the rescuers, our determination to see these great wrongs avenged, none of those different emotions, that tangled skein of human response, seems adequate to the occasion. For Australians, there are two particular respects in which the events of last Tuesday fill us with an especial grief and horror. The first is that so many of our own people have been killed. No peacetime event wrought by the hands of man has claimed so many Australian lives. So the grief and sorrow we feel today is not just for the people of America. We, no less than they, are the victims. But because of the place at which these horrible events happened, and because most of the thousands of victims were American citizens, we must feel today a special grief for the American people, that great and heroic nation which has stood shoulder to shoulder with Australia in peace and war throughout the hundred years of our own nationhood, and whose democratic institutions, in fact, provided many of the models for our own nationhood. Let me pay my own tribute to the American people. No doubt, like many in this place, I am fortunate to be able to count several Americans among my close friends. Those friendships, most of them made at a foreign university 20 years ago, brought home to me in a very personal way what my reading of American history had already taught me, that Americans are a people of the most exceptional nobility, idealism and generosity. Throughout the 20th century, the world, and in particular Australia, has stood in America's debt. It was America which came to the defence of Australia during the darkest hours of the Second World War, most notably during the Battle of the Coral Sea. It was America which rebuilt a devastated Europe after the Second World War in one of the greatest and noblest acts of the 20th century, the Marshall Plan. And it was America which led the free world through the long twilight struggle of the Cold War, making good on President Kennedy's pledge to defend freedom in its hour of maximum danger. Today, more people live in liberal democracies than ever before in history. No nation made so significant a contribution to that outcome than the United States. But the events of last Tuesday were not just an attack upon America. For the people who died in New York and Washington and Pennsylvania were not just Americans. Nor were those events just an attack upon the West. For many of those who were murdered were not Westerners. They were Japanese and Pakistanis and, Mal and Malaysians and Sri Lankans and people from many other lands from all corners of the globe. This was quite simply, an attack upon humanity itself, conceived by evil minds and wrought by evil means. If ever there was an occasion upon which the difference between good and evil was so starkly, so unambiguously demonstrated, this must be it. The calculated murder of thousands of innocent men and women the deliberate orphaning of thousands of innocent children. There can be no grey area in our reaction to these events. There is no moral ambiguity about them whatever. There is simply nothing that can be said 
in mitigation of them. At this most difficult of times, the worst mistake we could possibly make, and it is a mistake which some foolish commentators have already committed, is to regard the events of the 11th of September as a symptom or a herald of a clash of cultures. It was nothing of the sort. Those who perpetrated these gross crimes represented no culture or nation or religion. In particular, they did not represent Islam. As the American ambassador, the Honourable Tom Schieffer, observed at the moving memorial service which we attended earlier today, just as Adolf Hitler, although the product of a Christian nation, was no Christian, so those who perpetrated the mass murder of innocent people, whatever their national origins, were not Muslims. For people of the Muslim faith, just like those of the Christian faith, are adherents to a religion whose fundamental precepts are brotherhood and love. Last night I had the honour to represent the Prime Minister at the opening in Brisbane of the Dar al Uloom Islamic Academy, an institution built by many of the fine Australians who comprise the Islamic community in Queensland. During that ceremony, every one of the imams and other Muslim community leaders who spoke expressed the same heartfelt grief which we all feel, a grief which both transcends cultures and unites them. It is in that transcendence that there lies the way forward, the recognition born of shocking suffering of the common values of all peoples and of all the great religious faiths which define our very humanity, the values of love and decency and justice which have shaped the response of every civilised nation to the gross and appalling suffering which has been inflicted upon so many innocents. It is that recognition which can unite mankind in its determination that the events of last Tuesday, which forever changed the world, will not be permitted forever to change it for the worse. Senator Coonan. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the cowardly attack on the World Trade Center the Pentagon and the hijacking of the crashed aircraft in Pennsylvania were acts of pure evil. The viciousness and enormity of these terrorist attacks have barely sunk in. Our hearts go out to the loved ones of the over 5,000 victims and to the friends and relatives of the Australian victims. We pay tribute to the rescuers and the heroic firemen who lost their lives. We pay tribute to the American people in perhaps their darkest hour. Now is the time for sorrow and mourning. Now is the time for grief and cries for justice. America has been the bastion of the democratic freedoms that we take for granted. The attack on America is an attack on our own fundamental and shared values. In combating terrorism, the aim will be justice, but the means will pose new challenges. Terrorists are not a conventional enemy. They are, in their actions, calculated and committed to destruction. And as President George Bush has said, smoking them out will require both resolve and patience. We all acknowledge the practical difficulties of knowing who the enemy is and how to combat their methods. It is not intended, nor is it justifiable, to equate all people of Muslim faith with the fanatical terrorists who wreak havoc, clothed in the ideology of Islam. To suggest that such acts have the moral authority of one of the great faiths of the world is a travesty. Yesterday, I was invited to participate in a broadcast on an Arabic radio station. I was told of the anxiety of many law-abiding Muslims in Sydney who are just as horrified as the rest of us at the carnage and havoc that the world has just witnessed. Make no mistake, 
Those who destroy in the name of Islam and who propagate a culture of hate do not speak or act for most Muslims, certainly not the ones I have the privilege of knowing. We must guard against prejudice. We must guard against victimisation of Muslim people simply because of their religious faith. We must also be resolute in our conviction that terrorism must be eradicated. That is what is expected of us as leaders, that we will seek to ensure that the perpetrators are brought to justice and that such an event will never happen again. Of course, there can be no guarantees, but there must be unstinting efforts to achieve both of these objectives. How might this be done? Australia has committed to support, within our capabilities, United States-led action to bring those responsible to justice. This is in hand. It will be nothing short of a campaign, and Australia will honour our ANZUS obligations as we must and should. Terrorism is a global threat. To stamp it out requires international support. It will also require an understanding of the conditions that permit a culture of hate to take root and flourish. It is a supreme irony, I think, that those who hate America seek the fruits of economic prosperity that can only be fostered by a free and enterprising people. There are many challenges ahead in responding to terrorist attacks, not the least of which is to do so within the confines of international law and custom. The President of the United States, George Bush, has cast the net wide. He makes no distinction between those who carry out terrorist attacks and those who enable, support or harbour them. Seeking out harbouring states may pose some difficulties within the United Nations Charter, international law and the norms of conduct. Historically, the United Nations Security Council has not always sanctioned armed reprisal against harbouring states as an act of self-defence. But dealing with this shadowy enemy, reputed to have cells in 34 different countries, may and probably will require novel approaches to the territorial integrity of other states. The United States is quite rightly consulting widely and seeking international cooperation to stamp out terrorism. The hopes and aspirations of the free world mandate the justness of this cause. The course to victory may be long, but decency, tolerance, civilisation and freedom will triumph. There will be no turning back. I commend the motion in its entirety. Senator Calvert. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I too join with this condolence motion this afternoon. I don't know whether my speaker is operating. Obviously, he is. That's better. Um, and as a Tasmanian and therefore an Australian, I know that I speak on behalf of all Tasmanians in conveying uh, my condolences to the families and other loved ones, and particularly those families of those Australians who were killed or missing as a result of these chilling and cowardly terrorist attacks. I mean, if it had just been 70 Australians missing or killed by terrorists, it would have been something that this country of Australia would probably be, be thinking about and talking about for years to come. But to think when in, in totality we've got over 5,000 people missing and killed, it just uh, puts in perspective just what a terrific or well, shocking tragedy it's been. I also join the Senate in expressing uh, my, fa my own family's condolences to all those uh, nations, peoples who were, whose friends and relations were killed and are missing as a result of this tragedy. Many organisations and individuals have spoken about the enormity of, uh, of the events of last week, but even now we're still stunned and we're finding it hard to believe. As an American emergency management worker said, words can't describe the way it is. It's impossible. When who of us will ever forget those chilling video clips of, of a Boeing 767 disappearing into the side of a building, almost like a knife going into butter or a finger going into jelly? It just seemed quite impossible that something like that could happen. 
And we've been reminded many times over and over about the terrible loss of, uh, of life and how many, how many different countries have uh, been affected by this horrific act. I guess those images will last with us, of our generation anyway, uh, forever. I can only feel the greatest uh, respect for the American people, Madam, Madam President. Um, at times like this, their patriotism, their loyalty to, to each other, their belief in the God and their strength in the face of such a catastrophic attack on their everyday lives uh, is something that we, we all notice and, and take note of and I think uh, was summed up very admirably, admirably by the uh, American ambassador today. It doesn't seem all that long ago, Madam President, that we watched the Gulf War on CNN. And here again, uh, through CNN, we see this tragedy uh, that's brought the whole world uh, what brought to the whole world the tragedies that happened in New York. And like um, many of the people who've spoken today, I've been to New York a couple of times. It's a vibrant, busy, probably one of the cities of the world. And to see something like this happen, uh, I recall looking back on the Staten Island Ferry, looking back towards uh, New York and the Twin Towers and how they dominate this, this, the skyline of Manhattan Island. To think that buildings like that could be destroyed is almost beggar's belief. I'd like to pass on to the Senate some comments from a young man, a former Tasmanian, who has lived and worked in New York City for some time and who was lucky enough to escape alive. He was asked, will you leave the city now, given the tragic events that have unfolded here? And he replied, uh, no, I'll be staying put in New York City to help rebuild and reshape the city and its economy, he added. I'll also be helping those people in the city who are scarred or with losses, who are scared, no, scarred, or with losses, and I'll be helping them to return to normal life. And that seems to be the attitude of all New Yorkers, whether they be native New Yorkers or people who've gone there to live and work. And I know that many individual Australians are helping and will help in any way they can to rebuild and reshape and help Americans return to normal life, because I believe that's what they'd do if we were put in a similar situation. It's something we can be proud of the Australian capacity to get in and give, give of our time and resources in the event of a crisis. And that's been borne out many times here when we have crises in our own backyard, as we, so, for instance, as we, as, we, uh, as we saw at Port Arthur. I was certainly proud to hear the work of the Australian Consulate staff in New York and the assistance, uh, the assistance I've given to so many people. Last week uh, I was here on a CPA conference in Canberra and I was contacted by Bruce Goodluck's family. They were concerned about the welfare of Bruce and Cynthia, who were staying at uh, Millennium Hotel in New York. Uh, luckily, it was a Millennium Plaza next to the United Nations building, not the one that was next door to the Twin Towers. But uh, I couldn't think uh, they were concerned about uh, Bruce and Cynthia, and uh, um, I contacted Lou Lieberman, who's uh, in New York with Rosemary Crowley at the UN. Luckily, I was able to contact him, and uh, I would like to put on record. Uh, a, a tribute to Lou for the assistance he gave Bruce and his wife um, because they were certainly uh, must have been traumatised by what happened there and I think just to have a friendly voice um, helping them out would have been uh, something that uh, would they would have appreciated. I'd also like to thank uh, or put on record the work that Lou and Rosemary Crowley have been doing there, taking calls and uh, helping out wherever they can. And there's been other numerous examples of Australians in the, in the USA rallying around and lending a hand. I hope that all Australians will continue to assist in whatever way we can to overcome the loss and the scars of this tragedy. And I think we also, as been said earlier, let's hope that uh, Muslims in particular are not victimised because, uh, because of the uh, deeds of one or two of, uh, of the so-called Islamic faith that, uh, that they've... Uh, who've been responsible for this uh, massacre. As an American woman in New New Los Angeles was reported as saying, first we were shocked, then we were terrorised, now we're united. Well, America is united, and what I say, Australia is united in so many terrible ways with the American people in this tragedy. I fully concur with and strongly commend the motion to the Senate. Senator Ian MacDonald. Uh, Madam President, uh, I just briefly want to as associate myself uh, with the motion. Uh, my colleagues uh, in this chamber and the other place uh, have really said it all. They're really 
uh, is little more that uh, I need to uh, add. Uh, Madam President, um, all of us in some way um, in Australia, and I suspect this is the case right around the world, have been touched in a, in a personal way uh, in, in some uh, event by this uh, tragedy. In my case, I'm very pleased to say uh, two people I knew of who were in that vicinity uh, weren't um, injured uh, in any way, but I am conscious that uh, many in this chamber and in the parliament uh, have had experiences uh, not quite so uh, fortunate, in fact quite uh, tragic. Madam President, uh, I don't presume to speak for Queensland uh, uh, at all. Uh, I can only speak for myself, but uh, in the north we do have a lot of contact with Americans, tourists uh, to the north. I know what a fine people they are, and uh, my heart goes out to uh, many of those that I've met who would be uh, very much affected by the uh, tragedy. Uh, Madam President, uh, uh, I concur with all of the words uh, said about uh, all of us uh, living together, regardless of our religion or our creed. Uh, I know uh, a number of uh, Muslim people. In fact, uh, there's a family of Muslims uh, in uh, Brisbane uh, who are very uh, strong supporters of uh, the Liberal Party, very much involved, and they're a very fine uh, group of people, uh, people who uh, detest as much as we all do the tragedy and the violence uh, uh, in New York. Uh, as well, Madam President, as the Territory's Minister, one of the uh, great uh, uh, privileges I've had is to be able to uh, uh, travel to Cocos and Christmas Island uh, quite often, and certainly on Cocos Island in particular. Uh, the uh, majority of the population there are uh, uh, Cocos uh, uh, Malays, uh, all Muslims, or most of them uh, Muslims, um, and a number of uh, expatriate Australians who have taken on uh, the religion as well, and they are a kind, uh, gentle, uh, God-fearing uh, people uh, who, uh, although I haven't had the opportunity of speaking to them, uh, I know would be uh, horrified, uh, as we all are, uh, at the tragedy. And uh, those people uh, are just so kind, uh, so generous, uh, uh, so uh, supportive in uh, everything they do that uh, these sort of acts would be completely or as completely foreign to them as they are to the uh, rest of the world. Madam President, um, I join with uh, my colleagues in a heartfelt and sincere support for the uh, motion and the sentiments that it, it expresses. Senator Patterson. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, a number of people today have uh, mentioned their uh, having visited America or their association with America, the United States of America, and uh, I have uh, very deep uh, friendships and uh, relationships in the United States of America. My first visit there was when I was 17 um, on a Girl Scout exchange, and the people I met there have become lifetime friends. I revisited again as a guest of the Girl Scouts in 1965, and then again uh, where I spent three, or three months in Pennsylvania as a Kellogg, uh, in Michigan, I mean, as a Kellogg Fellow, another three months again in uh, Pennsylvania. My mother lived in America for 20 years and was an American citizen. So when I watched in utter disbelief on Tuesday night the sur surreal vision of those two planes crashing into the uh, World Trade Centres, and heard of what had happened in Pen the, Pentagon, uh, uh, the Pentagon, and also uh, heard what was happening to the plane, or heard that the plane had crashed in Pennsylvania with those very brave souls on board, and one wonders what one would have done if one had been on that plane. I'm not sure I would have been that brave. Who, it seems, uh, risked or gave their lives to avoid more people being killed. I couldn't help but think of all my friends in America and how invaded they would feel even if they weren't personally affected. Um, I said in my maiden speech, bygone battles like old sins cast long shadows. And although this is an unusual form of battle, and when I was talking to my father who saw or fought in three battlefields on his, and talked to him on his 80th birthday on Friday, he said to me, Kay, this is a modern day Trojan horse. A Trojan horse that came unexpectedly Hello? with uh, unexpected people uh, inside. Innocent people 
and people who could commit such a dastardly deed. This bygone battle, like an old, old sin, will cast long shadows on the families of those people who have been uh, killed, on the children, on the parents, on, the, on uh, all those who are, have been affected, on the people who have been involved in the rescue and the things that they have seen, on people who stood by, who escaped including Lucy Strasser, one of my good friends who was on the 64th floor of the second building and decided to leave when the first plane crashed. Those people will be scarred forever. Uh, the, there are just a myriad of people who will have been associated with this who will never be the same. The battle, will, like an old sin, will cast a very long shadow. I guess all of us, I don't think there'd be one Australian who was not touched or affected by what we saw. It seemed so unfair, it seemed so unreasonable, it seemed so horrendous. And my heart goes out to all those who've lost loved ones, in particular um, the Australians who still wait. It's, it's very difficult when you're so far away but for the people from nations all around the world who have lost citizens, who have lost husbands, wives, partners, children, the parents, the grandparents of friends who grieve them, my condolences to all of them. Indiscriminate hate, as we saw perpetrated on those innocent people going about their everyday lives, should not beget indiscriminate hate. I guess when I was reading the clippings today, I was um, overwhelmed by a comment by the brother of Leanne Whiteside, a young Australian who's missing and I guess presumed dead. And, he, and, he's, and, I, and I quote from the article from the Sunday Age, grieving over a sister he fears is almost certainly dead. He has been alarmed at reports of hostility towards Muslims in Australia, I mean quotes, I want them to know that I feel no malice towards them, he said. If there is one statement that is mine, because this is not about me, it is for the people in Australia to not directly direct any animosity towards Muslims, because that is not what we're feeling and this has nothing to do with religion. If a young man who's lost his sister can say that, surely all Australians of goodwill ought to be able to say the same and to be able to say, as the um, Ambassador for the United States said in his speech today, it is important for all of us to remember that just as Hitler was no Christian, those who committed these acts were not men and women of faith. No Christian, no Jew, no Muslim would have done such a thing. The common thread that runs through, through these great faiths is that love must conquer hate, good must defeat evil. And I guess that's a very strong message that ought to come to us. But also, um, my hope is that uh, the leadership of the United States and the other, world, uh, country, the other countries of the world which are joining with the United States and Australia too uses smart tactics in addressing this issue. And by smart I mean that we ensure as far as possible that we direct our concern the need to seek justice towards those who have perpetrated this crime, and that as far as possible innocent people who had no part of this are, are spared. And that will, that will take enormous courage, enormous commitment and tactics that most probably we have never had to use before in the history of this world that we try as far as possible to use smart tactics, just as we've tried to use smart sanctions in, uh, in removing aid to make it more difficult for perpetrators rather than for the whole, whole populations. It is going to be a challenge to all of us, in particular those of us who have responsibility here in parliament in the leadership role. As I watched, as we all did, hours and hours of CNN and saw the American flag 
um, fluttering over the rubble and devastation that was the World Trade Centres, I guess you couldn't, I couldn't help but think of the uh, American national anthem that, uh, that says, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in the air. And I guess they weren't rockets red glare or bombs bursting in the air, but a modern Trojan horse gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that spar spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. Senator Eggleston. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I rise to express my sympathy with the people of New York and, the, and to the, with the American people for the loss of life and devastation which has followed last week's terrorist attacks. I have relatives living in New York City, so I have some direct knowledge of the impact this attack has had on the people of that great city. The New York incident has implications for us all. After New York, nowhere in the world can be regarded as safe from terrorist attack. New York is, is acknowledged as the capital of the Western world and if New York can be attacked in this, this way, so can Perth, Sydney, Hobart or Canberra. Henry Kissinger has recently written a book entitled Does America Need a Foreign Policy? in which he observes that traditional borders between nation states have less significance in the contemporary world and, the world and that the world is now moving towards a more internationalist approach to solving problems. The worldwide reaction to the New York incident is an example of how much of a global village the world has become when people throughout the world could watch the events of last Tuesday in New York live on CNN regardless of where they were. Madam President, it is a sad thing to reflect that so many of the most vicious conflicts, both historically and in the world of today, have involved religious differences. For example, the Catholic-Protestant conflict, which has been current since the late 1960s in Ireland, has a 400-year history of religious antagonism behind it. The so-called ethnic cleansing the world has observed with horror in Bosnia and Kosovo in the former Yugoslavia is a historic clash between believers in Christianity and Islam. The long-standing Arab-Israeli conflict over the territory of Palestine is an old conflict where, again, religion is an important component. It is sad when observing these conflicts to think that essentially the function of most religions in today's world is to provide rules for people to live by. Most religions require fairness and tolerance in dealing with others, and it is truly sad that these worthy principles are all too often observed in their abeyance, and that religion becomes a factor in brutal conflicts and mindless acts of terrorism. Of course, Political factors, separately or concurrently, also frequently underlie terrorism and are often a manifestation of the frustrations of one group or another that one group or another may feel. However, when brutal attacks on the innocent occur, as happened last week in New York, regardless of the factors which led to the act of terrorism, such acts of terrorism can never be condoned as a means of resolving disputes, so it is right and proper that those responsible should be hunted down and punished. In keeping with Henry Kissinger's observations about the new internationalism in world affairs, it is appropriate that a broad coalition of nations around the world which believe in the rule of law and the sanctity of human life should be joining together to root out and punish those responsible for the acts of terrorism which occurred last week in New York. 
Nations which believe in the rule of law must join together to protect the innocent, the ordinary people of the world, from those who have no hesitation in using indiscriminate violence to achieve their ends. Madam President, I commend this motion to the Senate and support its endeavours. Senator Tambling. Madam President, last Tuesday and Wednesday's tragedy in the United States, I think, was the first time since the death of President Kennedy that I had an immediate and an emotional reaction that I can't really describe other than something as a very uncomfortable deep pit in the stomach. And my immediate thought was for a young Darwin girl who I knew was working in that environment, and until I was able to establish that she was safe, I felt really caught up in the whole issue. I'm pleased to support the motion before the Senate this evening, and when I look at the key words and the key phrases and the tenets of each of those motions, where we talk about the assault, the attack, the horror, and where we look at the emotions that are necessary to look at now, the sympathy, the condolence, the loss, the courage, the commitment and the tolerance, then it gives me a great deal of strength to know that uh, we've been able to come together this afternoon to address these important issues as we shared with the American ambassador at lunchtime. The, there is a very special relationship with the United States of Australia. I'm well aware of it as a Northern Territorian, and I know so many of my constituents are, because that deep goes back into the uh, realms of history in the Second World War. Uh, and very recently, only a week or so ago, very major joint military exercises in northern Australia, where I spent time um, on the naval, U.S. naval ships. I spent time talking to the Marines and knowing of that combined operation. And also in the Northern Territory, we have the important facility at Pine Gap, which must be being taxed at this particular important time because of the very important security issue. But the other thing as a Territorian that I feel about Pine Gap is that it makes me feel immediate sympathy for the many American families living in Alice Springs and the great impact in the community that bind the Northern Territory and the United States and how particularly strong that is. So the issues to me are regional security, but they're also social. And today I looked very keenly at the faces and the emotions on the young people who were visiting us in the gallery whilst this debate was taking place earlier in the day. And last Tuesday's tragedy to me is an even more important tragedy because of the impact on the millions and millions of us kids, children, not only in Australia but throughout the world, who must be feeling this in such an important way. And there is, we need to recognise, an important need for psychological um, care, very close counselling, and the fact that the events of last week will alter so dramatically the education throughout uh, the world of young people. Another social issue that impacted on me was the changes to risks of travel. We all know when we travel we take certain risks, but now we will always think when we get on an aeroplane. You know, I noticed last, yesterday travelling down from Darwin, I looked at other people seriously and questioningly. Uh, and uh, in that respect, um, we need to know how is it going to impact not just on the tourist industry, but on each of us and our own internal views and security. There will be dramatic economic consequences of this particular issue around the world for years to come. We saw the devastation uh, of the, the assets, the buildings, but uh, it will have such profound economic consequences right around the world for many years and <coughs> will steep into the areas uh, of defence planning. An area closer to home for me is the immediacy of the link and the policy areas relating to illegal immigration. 
Our community and our electorates are taxed by the very hard decisions that the government has to make in this particular regard, and particularly to countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan, where there is a natural focus. And the comments that other senators have made today about the need for very special tolerance and understanding is so important. Again, I highlight the Northern Territory as a very multicultural place where many races and religions live in harmony. The events of last week will now tax us so seriously that it will affect each and every area of policy making. And finally, my comments today are those that uh, are with regard to the issues relating to religious focus and fanaticism, because we can only describe the horror of last week as being that of fanatics seeking to impose their will and their inadequate and totally wrong consequences on so many of the others. There is a need for religious focus. There is a need for challenge in the future on peace and tolerance. And I know that I speak for so many Territorians who share the concerns of their other Australians uh, and particularly would have us convey those important sentiments through to the United States. Senator Bolfus. So to speak briefly on this, uh, knowing that the time is running against us, um, I also won't forget where I was when JFK died, when John Lennon died, and uh, when I saw the bombing of the United States of America. It was eerie. It was eerie to see it happen. It was immediate. It was not delayed like the previous two. It wasn't relayed. We saw monument after monument fall over. It was frightening. There was a sort of sense of uh, when was it going to end? Was it ever going to end? Was it going to keep on going endlessly? And uh, in that fear, I was glad that I was uh, away in bed in Adelaide in uh, an out-of-the-way place. I've got to say we were speechless. It was with some sense of disbelief that I took a phone call from one of my state colleagues, Pat Conlon, who told me that uh, World Trade Building had been attacked. My response was, as I was trying to put a baby to sleep, uh, mate, it's not on the Channel 10 News, it's not happening. But it was relayed, it was delayed in a sense, but very soon it came on, it was real. And I suppose uh, I was hoping it was a bit like H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds, that we would wake up the next morning and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't real. And it wasn't just an attack on buildings, it wasn't just an attack on innocent victims. It was an attack on civilised society, on basic democratic values, on structures, as such, it was an attack on all of us and what we stand for. These acts go to and challenge the heart of organised community. Some in the left have always, a lot in the left have always held a view about the USA which hasn't been flattering. But let me say that I think it's an outdated view, unfair, immature, based on, I think, stereotypes through mass media. It's a country built on migration and its diversity and its power from both its diversity and its population. In this case, the USA is the real victim but also it's a symbolic victim because I think it stands for the sorts of values that we want to defend in this particular case. The enormity of the event uh, was made even more personal to me because of uh, my contact with uh, a person who's been mentioned in both Houses of Parliament today, Andrew Knox. I thought I'd convinced Andrew to stand for uh, Macon the last time I saw him, but uh, he chose uh, to have greater experience in the world and unfortunately we haven't heard from him uh, since the event. And, uh, I obviously hope that we do, but he was a great young person, a great young Labor person, who, if he doesn't, uh, if he's not found, will be sorely missed. I'm also touched by the fact that it's New York. Robert Hill and I spent uh, three months here in 1986, a state enormously energetic in its diversity, a state where communities coexist extremely well. It is, I think, the true global village. And I think it's a greater offence that the global village was chosen for an act of global diversity and terrorism. The response won't be easy. This resolution before us today talks of response, but it has to happen. There has to be a response because the, I, don't, I don't think the world community can allow these acts to go unchallenged. The West can't allow them to go unchallenged, but also let's have uh, no, no uh, misunderstanding about this. This is also an attack on Islam, the established order of Islam, the, the faith of Islam. This is foreign to the teachings of Islam. And I'm sure Islamic countries, peace-loving as they are around the world, would find this a major offence and a threat to them as well. Hard task one is to find the perpetrators. Bin Laden has boasted over the years that uh, Vietnam, sorry, that uh, the USSR was destroyed in Afghanistan and he was teasing and tempting the United States of America to get into Afghanistan as well. There has to be, uh, justice has, has to have its day, but it will be difficult unless 
that day happens very quickly. Ground forces in Afghanistan raise all sorts of problems for not just the USA but for the whole world community. It's something that I'm sure GW Bush is quite aware of, President Bush is aware of, and something that we in this place need to keep in mind. Because if this uh, battle does become, and if they do identify the, uh, the perpetrators as being people in Afghanistan, if this battle does become one on the ground in Afghanistan, then we are going to have somewhat of a long battle and a long process to go through. Justice must have its day. That's also a challenge for um, Western communities because I think the expectation in those communities is probably blowing out of proportion at the moment. The more we see the enormity of the effects of this terror, the more I think people are aggrieved, and rightly so. And that uh, sense of uh, resentment has built an enormous expectation of revenge, and that's something that leaders around the world, I think, need to uh, be able to contain. Justice must have its day, but this cannot be allowed to get out of control. The other thing I find quite uh, difficult in respect to this is, uh, is what it's doing to our own community. We in this place have a responsibility to, uh, to govern this community in a very cohesive way. As a former immigration minister, I have uh, still maintained friendship amongst all communities and uh, do so with uh, Jewish and Muslim communities in this country. They, and I, I talk here about the Muslim communities, whose the main figures I know across the country. They are as, as offended, as aggrieved, as hurt, and as upset as the rest of us in respect to this. They, when these extremists took this action, they didn't speak for decent law-abiding Muslims. They didn't speak for Islam. As I say, the, these actions are foreign to the teachings of, of Islam. In recent days, we've seen some degree of uh, uh, racial um, tension in parts of, of our community. We should remember and I say this to Australians generally, we should remember that over 50 years of, of large migration to this country, we haven't had, from those communities coming from the Middle East, we haven't had, had acts, of, acts of terrorism at home. We have been quite selective, we have been discerning, we've had the mechanisms in place to ensure terrorists have been rejected, and I think this country has been all the better for the fact that we've had those systems in place. These communities have not been responsible for acts of terrorism in this country, and uh, it's not within their character and culture and religion to perpetrate such acts. So, Madam, Madam President, uh, I support this resolution. As I say, it is a challenge to, uh, to communities around the world. There will be an overwhelming world reaction to it, um, but as I say, uh, it needs to be handled in such a way that it doesn't get out of control. Senator Hill. Madam President, um, in concluding the debate, I wanted to thank all senators who participated and recognise that there are other senators who wish to participate uh, but within the time allowed have been unable to do so. And I know my colleagues, Senators Alston and Vanstone, who are at the Cabinet meeting, have been unable to do so but wanted to. Um, there, there would appear to be um, a unanimous support within the Senate to um, paragraphs uh, one to five and eight of this uh, of this motion, and, um, and I appreciate that. I think it's, uh, it's important for the Senate um, unanimously in these events to express its horror at this terrorist attack or these terrorist attacks, to convey to the people of the United States our deepest sympathy and sense of shared loss, to extend our condolences to the families and loved ones who are missing. Uh, to uh, declare that such attacks represent an assault not only on the United States but on the values that we share, the values of free societies everywhere, to praise the courageous efforts of those engaged in the dangerous rescue operation, uh, and to encourage all Australians in the wake of these appalling events to display the qualities of tolerance and inclusion uh, which have been assaulted by the terrorists in their awful actions. So um, uh, I'm pleased about that and I'm pleased that the record will show uh, that senators from all sides of the chamber are prepared to support those sentiments. Um, I do feel that I've got to say a few words in relation to paragraphs 6 and 7, about which there doesn't seem to be unanimity in the chamber and about which there has been one, uh, one motion uh, one amendment already already moved. If I might uh, commence with with paragraph seven, this is the 
This is the paragraph, Madam President, which, which states that the Senate fully endorses the commitment of the Australian government uh, to support within Australia's capabilities United States-led action against those responsible for these, uh, these tragic attacks. It is, it is the, the position of the government, Madam President, that those who perpetrated such actions must be brought to justice. Uh, and that includes those who are facilitating such terrorists, those who are supporting such terrorists. Uh, this is not a call for vengeance or retribution, but there must be a firm response to such horrific crimes. And those of us who share such values of freedom and, and democracy must be prepared to shoulder that responsibility. The Prime Minister has said that we stand shoulder to shoulder with the United States in accepting that responsibility. And I'm proud that we are prepared to do so. Apart from the need to protect the values of freedom and democracy, in my opinion, we owe it to those who've lost their lives, particularly the Australians. This is not a matter of giving the United States a blank cheque, but we will do our bit if asked to help bring the perpetrators of these horrendous crimes to justice and in an effort, Madam President, to contribute to a safer world. And I hope that all senators might be prepared to endorse that sentiment when this motion is taken to the vote in a few moments' time. Paragraph 6 is the paragraph which states that the Senate believes that the terrorist actions in New York and Washington, D.C constitute an attack upon the United States of America within the meaning of Articles 4 and 5 of the ANSYS uh, Treaty. Madam President, in the view of the government, uh, this is a new form of waging war. But we accept it nevertheless to be an act of war. It wasn't just an assault on individuals. It was clearly intended as an assault, as an attack on the United States. That's clearly why it was the institutions of the United States that were targeted. And it was a particularly vile way in which to wage law, war, because the institutions were attacked through the means of slaughtering thousands of innocent victims. In such circumstances, it was the Australian Cabinet's view that the terrorist actions constituted an attack on the United States, and thus the ANZUS Treaty should be invoked. A treaty is not a one-way street. Uh, there are within it benefits for Australia, but for that we accept responsibilities as well. Uh, and we believe that Australia should be prepared to meet its responsibilities in these, uh, in these circumstances. Madam President, I do therefore urge those senators who, who are hesitating in supporting paragraphs six and seven of this motion uh, to think again. I urge them to join with us on this occasion and to support us uh, in the motion that we put before the chamber. There may, be, there may be a call for Australians in uniform in the future to risk their lives to protect Australia's interests arising out of this terrorist attack. And in our view, it's important that they, that they understand that they are getting the support from this chamber that we believe they deserve. The question is that the amendment to the motion moved by Senator Brown be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Was there more than one voice? Those against? I think the motion is lost. I did not hear two voices call in the first instance in support of the amendment. I recall Senator Bourne asking that Clause 7 be put separately. Are you wishing that that should persist? Did you ask for Clause 6 to be put separately? My understanding was that you didn't. At the time, I didn't ask for 6. I only asked for 7. I beg your pardon? At the time, I only asked for 7. I shall put the motion as printed without Clause 7, that is, Clauses 1 to 6 inclusive and Clause 8. The question is 
that this resolution be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I put clause seven as printed. Those in support of the clause say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I ask senators to stand in silence in memory of those killed as a result of the terrorist attacks in the United States of America. Senator Hill. Uh, I move that as a mark of respect uh, to the memory of those killed as a result of the terrorist attacks in the United States of America that the Senate do now adjourn. The Senate stands adjourned until 2pm tomorrow, the 18th of September. <laughs>